All right, I think we are live according to what I just saw. Let me know if you're seeing me. Let me know if you're hearing me. Let me know if I sound okay as well. We got a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. This has been an interesting week. Right now, it's finally sunny outside. It's been raining for the last few days, and the temperature is supposed to go up to almost 75 degrees Fahrenheit today. So, so far, we have a few people already on board. Xbox 199 from Germany. Heidelberg, I believe. He's got a Pro 1000. Great. I'm glad you're here because we're going to be talking and talking and talking about the Pro 1000. Yeah, I love that printer. Don't get me wrong. But it does demand a lot from the user. All right, so... Come on, folks, let me know if you are able to hear me. Right now I have Michael from Connecticut, Cavalier from Connecticut, USA, and myself, just the two of you with me. Antonio Biggio is here. Um, PHVFX, Copenhagen. Uh, Richard is here. He's from L.A. He's got a Pro 1000. And again, we're getting some people here finally. That's good. Um, blank, black screen. I don't know why you're seeing a black, blank screen. Let me check YouTube. Make sure that we are actually live on YouTube as well. I usually don't watch YouTube because of this problem. Sure that we are. Yeah, we are. We're okay. We're okay. Always delayed in YouTube by about 10 seconds from if I do this, you're going to see that 10 seconds later, the same thing happens with TV broadcasts. All righty. Let's see who else we got here. Antonio says, yes, I hear Richard says, uh, from LA, of course, um, Michael, I don't know what was wrong, but it should be okay. I just checked myself. I could see myself on YouTube. Um, they recommend that you don't do that as a uh, broadcaster. Watch yourself live on your broadcasting software. We're using StreamYard, which is a free utility. I'm kind of looking into whether it's worth upgrading to the for pay utility. They really don't give you uh, anything extra other than maybe have some more screens uh, that you can show at the same time. Right now, we can only share one screen at the same time. Charles, let's see. Xbox 199 says, uh, yes, we, you. Okay. Uh, Andrew Mantovani from the Bronx is here. Uh, Robert Mayer has a Pro 100. Antonio Biggio, Biggio has, a, he didn't say, he's from Italy, of course. Uh, Scott from New Mexico is here. I'm going up because I miss a few of you. Uh, Badger Tails, you from Wisconsin by any chance? Uh, let's see, Sassy 1987. Sarah from the UK has a Pro 2000, awesome. Awesome. Uh, whatever we discuss about the Pro 1000 tonight, that'll apply as well for the 2021 brand new uh, upgrade to that printer. Uh, all of this will apply to that. Michael says everything's okay right now. Michael Cavalier has an Epson P800. Awesome. Sammy Castro, 13, Detroit, Michigan. Peter Yorth, uh, Peter from Copenhagen. Pro 10 just moved to my home and I'm about to set it up. All right, good luck. Sexy Pro 1000 owner, that's Crypto Time Lord. He has a Pro 1000. Great. I'm glad all you Pro 1000 lovers are here. Okay. We got one more here. Glenn Goldstein, Canon. G3200 mega tanks. Okay, I'm not too familiar with those. You also have a uh, Pro 100. Now, I'm going to go ahead and remove the 
banner. I don't think we need that anymore. We know who we are already. And what I can do and show you guys, when you guys ask a question, and, you know, so that you all don't have to follow on the chat, I'll go ahead and post it, for instance, like, hi, I'm from Michigan, just got done printing on my Epson P400. Okay. So that is one that I don't have. And I'm going to wait possibly until something newer comes out because this was just too similar to the R2000. And to tell you the truth, I haven't even powered on that printer for probably a year. I just simply don't need it. I'm thinking about cleaning it up, cl cleaning it up and clearing it up and then sell it along with probably about 15 full carts of ink that I have. Those are brand new OEM, okay? It's not going to be super cheap, but it'll be a heck of a deal because it is a fabulous printer. I just don't really have use for it at this point. I got other printers that I use more often than the R2000. When I got it, it was simply to just have it available. And then all of a sudden, they started to um, make these offers with these OEM card sets that were real. And I got some for like eight bucks each, the set that is not each cartridge, but each eight cartridge set. How how do you ask? You know how is this possible? Well, that printer was being used for the direct to garment industry, and people were these people, uh, not regular people, but these people were converting them to carry a flat carrier instead of a normal feeder, so that you can then mount a T-shirt over a board and it would go into the printer and then come out and print on it and it worked so they had no use for the original inks because they cannot be used on fabric you need special inks for that they're sort of like a vinyl type based ink it just wrecks havoc with the print heads by the way uh, even if you buy a dedicated um so-called dedicated um Direct to garment printer, it'll still it'll still cause all kinds of problems with it. All right, let me take this off of here. Now I gotta look for it. Ah. Steven, where's Steven's comment? Here we go. All right. So yeah, Pro 1000. I don't know if you guys saw a recent video that I uploaded, okay? And I talked a lot about some comments that were made by a gentleman who I'm going to go ahead and feature in a minute. I'm going to go ahead and go, when I jump over to Facebook, I'm going to go ahead and, and just cover what he's been talking about. He's been using the Pro 1000 for quite a while. He actually has two of them. Actually, no, he went through one, uh, figured out that what it was doing was really uh, a problem, that it wasn't normal. After complaining to Canon for quite a while, they agreed to swap the printer for a brand new one again. And guess what? Their brand new one behaved the same way because that's just the way the Pro 1000 behaves. Now, let's talk about something that people constantly are asking about. Um, how much waste ink does it generate? I mean, I want to know like actual grams of ink. You got to use grams because that's the only thing you can actually weigh. I'm not going to be able to extract the liquid and then show you in milliliters, you know, CC how much it is. Yeah, I can only tell you in weight. So in order to be able to do this, and you can do this periodically as you are using your printer, whether you use it a lot daily, producing many, many prints per day, and maybe let it rest for a couple of days and then come back and begin production again. Because really, the truth of the matter is, this printer is not a printer for you to just sit and look at. It's not for that. It's going to drive you to the poorhouse if you do that. Okay? Yeah. Uh, if you want to do that and you still want to stick with Canon, then get a Pro 100. It's a lot more forgiving than the Pro 1000, 2000 and higher. They all behave this same way, okay? You think they're just using all of your expensive ink just to create waste, just to rob you. And you really don't understand the reasons 
behind this engineering that has been programmed into these printers. It's crazy. My wife hates when people say, it's crazy. I use that all the time. Um, <clears throat> Sus Sassy, 1987, just asked this. And the answer is, yeah. Although I don't have one, they use the same print hit, they use the same print engine. It's just physically a larger capacity printer. The same ink set, different types of cartridges, yes, but still the same printer, basically, okay? What the Pro 1000 produces, the 2000 will produce pretty much identically, as long as you calibrate both printers internally so that they output correctly. So, yeah, yeah, they will, you know, if you're not ready for this behavior, or, or the idiosyncrasies of this printer, you're going to be pissed, okay? And you're going to go like, why the hell did I buy this? Well, research, my friends, and that's what I'm here for, to give you guys, you know, at least what I am aware of and what others have shared with me about these printers. So, an empty, brand-new maintenance cartridge. Hold on. Where did I put it at? Now I can't find it. Oh, right here in front of me. Right here. Brand new. You can see that the, the little sponge there is nice and clean. This weighs, using a gram scale such as this, this is a uh, 0 to 500, I believe, gram scale. Very accurate. I managed to get a weight after repeated attempts of about 277 point something. So I called it 278. So we're going to go ahead and do that. 278 is what we're going to call it. And I'm setting up my calculator here. And so as you are printing and as you hear and basically feel and hear and see that your printer is not immediately printing, it's performing some actions that you just cannot understand what they are. Let me try to describe some of these actions that you will hear, and you will then mistakenly call them cleaning cycles when in reality they are not, okay? So say you haven't used, like I haven't, okay? I'm just as guilty as anyone else, but I have learned to live with it. My Pro 1000 probably hasn't been used for about a week and a half, okay? I did a bunch of prints that are back here recently on it. I wanted to test whether it could handle slightly curly paper cut from a roll. So I cut some paper and ran it through it. I made probably like, I don't know, seven, um, what were they? Um, 17 by 25, the limit for that printer with the current not updated firmware. And it handled it. It handled it well. I was I was shocked at first because i thought the unstableness of the paper would would play havoc with it but the transport mechanism of the pro 1000 is simply superb so it handled it just right <clears throat> so what people are saying about you know updating the firmware and then being able to cut off you know 47 inch long sheets of paper from a roll that may actually work i was worried about skewing and that sort of thing but just make sure that you're Edges are perfect right angles to the leading edge so that the printer registers it perfectly to begin with. And that way your travel will remain straight rather than gradually being skewed toward one side or the other. That will cause all kinds of problems. Anyway, so I wanted to know how much ink was being used because when I started up the printer after another fairly lengthy break of no action. Uh, although I've been kind of trying to do mo nozzle checks, but I have 13 printers to do that with. And sometimes I use QImage, the automated type purge uh, sheet printing, but quite often I, I turn QImage off or I reboot my computer and I forget to set everything up. So that printer sat for a while. It performed this. 
the first thing it does, you hear a pumping action. It's like, and then a little bit faster, and then a little bit faster. It's a sequence of little pumps. And that is internal ink agitation. Okay, that's what it's doing. So it's kind of reviving that ink that sat stagnant for God knows how long. Okay, it's resuspending it. And so that is a good thing. You want that. What other printer does that, right? So thank you, Canon Pro 1000 and higher. Now, the next thing it did was it began to hear the pump working. Well, what you didn't hear was the actual cleaning cycle taking place, the actual sucking of ink from the print head from the purge pad. The purge pad is on the far right. That's where the printer parks its print head on when you are done printing. It sits on top of that pad. The pad is basically a ceramic porous sponge, I call it, or many people call it that. But it's really just a, a rectangular piece of ceramic that has been punched with a million little you know holes, basically. And on the Canon Pro 1000, there are three sectors. These sectors, that whole rectangle plus those three sectors are basically surrounded by a gasket and that gasket seals against the bottom of the printhead it moves over it sits there for a while and then it just clamps itself on it okay and don't don't move it don't try to move it you will cause some damage so it's actually sealed there and that sealing keeps it from drying anything on the surface of the printhead nozzle plate so it did the agitation it moved over to the purge pad. It clamped itself on it. If you have a nice seal, okay, then it performs the sucking action. It applies a little bit of vacuum. It sucks a certain amount of ink out, and then it detaches itself and moves sideways a little bit toward the left. That's when you hear the whirling action when, that you call a cleaning cycle. That's the internal pump sucking out that pool of ink that is now sitting on top of that ceramic porous rectangle, okay? And so it is sucking ink from all 12 channels. Each little sector has four channels isolated. So you got four, four, and four, totaling eight. That ink being sucked with by the pump, basically, it's a peril peristaltic pump, whatever they call it. And that goes into the internal wasting pad in a regular printer, but in this case, one of these puppies right here. And this one is dirty, okay? This one is declared full. Um, notice that if I tip it upside down, nothing really comes out. I could store it in this position and that sponge will still remain the same. So I don't know internally what it looks like, I don't have the nerve to crack one open. But anyway, so that is it. That ink that is generated with that cleaning cycle goes into this cartridge right here. Now, why did it run a cleaning cycle? Because I let it sit for a week and a half or two weeks. Well, that exceeded a certain length of time. And it's 60 hours, 120, 240, and 480. So 480, I believe, is like five days, is it? Maybe. Let's see. 120 is five days. Yeah. So 60 is two and a half, five, 10, 20. So depending on the length of time that was triggered, in other words, if you made it past 60, then you get a certain size cleaning cycle. If you go beyond 120, then it's a larger cleaning cycle. And again, 240 largest. And the largest is the four. 80. So how much ink does it generate? Well, the only way to know is to have weighed, say for instance, you're starting with a brand new cartridge and that weighs 278 grams. So you may want to say in a week, you have noticed that every time you print, it makes some sort of noise, whether it's a cleaning cycle or a you know a, the 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 agitation pumping uh, 
process going on, whatever. You can remove this cartridge from the rear of the printer. You have to go in your LCD and tell it that you want to, you know, remove your maintenance cartridge. And then you remove it and you weigh it again. So you've kept a record of the previous dry weight and now the current weight and subtract the difference. So the current weight of this wet one, we'll find out right now. We're going to go ahead and weigh it. I'm not going to be able to show you this. So just take my word for it. We'll let it reset. I have it set for grams. It is set to 0, 0.00. We'll put this right on top. And I'm reading 468.6. Remember what the dry weight was? 278. So we're going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and share the screen with my calculator. We're going to go ahead and enter with my keyboard. What was it? Now I forgot. All right, let's try this again. Yeah, 468.6. So we'll go ahead and enter 468.6. I think. Let's try that again. 468. We'll just call it 469. How about that? And we're going to subtract 278. So that gives you 191 grams of ink currently live inside that cartridge. That's how much ink it has dumped in here. Okay. Keep in mind, one cartridge is 80 milliliters of ink. So that's about two plus something full cartridges of ink in that um wasting cartridge that's really not a lot these things can hold okay so you're going to probably be changing these relatively um frequently if you are printing a lot and you say wait a minute you say if you are printing a lot i thought printing a lot reduced the cleaning cycles no, I hate to tell you, but it does not. It actually increases the cleaning cycles, but it increases them because it needs to. So as I said in my video the other day, the timed cleaning cycles are pretty much etched in stone. So let me just give you a scenario like somebody just said, well, I'll just run nozzle checks. Well, in nozzle check, you may have seen them before I have one here somewhere, probably uses a fraction, I mean a fraction of a milliliter of ink total to print it. So say you run one every week and you think you're exercising your printers, you know, keeping it nice and happy and clear. Well, you are in a way, but because you doing it only every seven days, say every Sunday evening, and you really haven't printed for the last four or five weeks, all you've been doing is running a cleaning cycle. Even if you did it every three days, you still exceeded that 60 hour. So it's going to run a cleaning cycle pretty much every time you run a nozzle check. Okay. And that cleaning cycle uses milliliters of ink total, not just a fraction like the, you know, like the uh, nozzle check does, but several milliliters the only way like i said it's for you to you you hear it you you know you print your nozzle check check the weight of this and then compare it to three days ago and that'll tell you exactly how much ink has been dumped in there and you still don't know because there's some ink probably left in the lines leading to this from the purge pump so it's not an exact science but it will tell you approximately close enough for government work, as I say, how much ink has been wasted on that cleaning cycle. So what else could trigger this kind of cleaning? Well, even when you are printing a lot, and especially when you are printing a lot, it actually has to do it. It's a thermal printing process. I've said, I've said this a million times. People are yelling at me, why are you rehashing this stuff? 
don't people know already all about this this behavior? I said, no, apparently not, because every week I get I get barraged by questions and literally angry people, you know, maligning the printer because it's robbing them of their expensive ink. Okay, so apparently they're not hearing what I am putting out. So every couple of months I have to revisit the same subject. Well, you're printing a lot. You're creating, for instance, let's just say a bunch of 17 by 22 beautiful prints on some gorgeous watercolor or texture type fine art paper. So this requires a higher level of density of ink. So you're going to actually be using more ink than you would normally use, say, on a luster paper print. So you're using, you know, a pretty good amount of ink, and you feel really happy that at least finally you're producing what? Photos, prints. That's what the printer is made for. It's not made to look at. It's made to make, you know, beautiful prints for you. So you create all of these prints, and say you use, I don't know, six, seven milliliters of ink per print total. Well, that amounts to a really, you know, good amount of ink. Oh. You're using ink. Oh, God. No, I don't want to use my ink. It costs too much. Too bad. Yeah, too bad. That's what the printer is for. Okay? So you're producing inks. Say you use a total of 100 milliliters of ink in your batch of prints. Well, let me tell you what's going to happen. If you're printing large prints like that that require con continuous printing for 22 inches length of paper, that's going to create residue. If I get a griddle on my kitchen, my stovetop, and I put a little bit of butter and I, you know, two slices of bread with a slice of cheese inside, and I make myself a grilled cheese, both sides, when I remove that bread, there's some residue being left on the pan. Okay. That's what happens. You're exploding, boiling, if you will, ink that is made from glycol and pigment particles and other agents okay it's going to create and build up a continuous increase of whatever this residue is and that's why maybe after the third or fourth large print the printer's going to stop before it allows you to create another print in your batch of say 50 17 by 22s like every four or five prints it's going to run a cleaning cycle but you say, why? I'm printing. My nozzles should be clear. No, they're becoming clogged. <laughs> Makes no sense, right? Yes, they're becoming clogged because of this buildup, okay? And so that has to be exhausted out. It has to be flushed out. So cleaning cycle comes into play. It has nothing to do with your 60 hours, 120 hours, nothing whatsoever to do with that. It just happens. Why? Because it has to. If it doesn't, then the, the printhead will become damaged because of the process it utilizes. And it's not just these families of printers. Okay. I believe also the old HP large format photo printers, thermal printheads, that's why they were made to be user replaceable. Okay. The only printer family that uses PSO technology, PSO crystal technology, are the cold firing printheads that Epson printers use. That's why you cannot change them yourself. It's not a matter of unclamping a couple of clamps and pulling the printhead out and replacing it with a new one. No, you have to do some dismantling. You better know what you're doing. Then you have to reprogram it. Yeah, indeed, you have to. So, you know, Canon printers are wonderful. Okay, but they do have these properties. But again, it's not just them. If HP was still in the business of photo printers, they would use the same technology. I really don't know whether Epson has a patent on these types of printheads, the cold firing printheads. You can abuse the living crap out of them, and you know they they will take the abuse. Whereas thermal printheads simply cannot cannot. Let me show you the simplest, simplest kind of thermal print head there is. Hold on. This is an old Lexmark 
what is it? A 26. So this is a color printhead, tricolor. Okay, magenta, yellow, cyan. Um, a lot of the older Lexmark printers used them. My primary disc, Primera disc printer uses these. Okay, they use these. Actually, they use the same. Well, long story. They charge fifty dollars for their cartridge, even though it's a twenty dollar cartridge. But they put a barcode down here that is read by the printer sensor. Long story for that. We're not going to get into that. But these are thermal print heads as well. Every time you change a cartridge, you're changing the print head. So the print heads actually come with the cartridge. And old HP printers use the same type of technology. Now, now they do not. Now you have print heads that you can actually remove and replace. So yeah, these these types of print heads are made to self-destruct themselves. And that's what is happening. Every time you print, oh, should I be telling you this? Oh gosh. Every time you print on a Canon printhead, you are self-destructing. It is self-destructing itself. Okay. The higher end printers from Canon have more nozzles than they actually use in any one time. They're, they call them redundant nozzles. I don't know what the numbers are. I just know that there are many, okay? So as they are being burnt out through your misuse or just the process itself, they're constantly being replaced by these other non-used or redundant nozzles. It's an automatic um, procedure. That's why you have to set your your uh, LCD um, properties to auto detect, okay, that, that situation. That way it can just immediately on the fly replace a nozzle that may not be performing optimally. It just replaces it. That way you don't even notice what's happening when you are printing. At some point, one of those 12 channels will no longer have sufficient nozzles. It'll just run out of them. And it'll keep on printing until one of those remaining sets, whatever that number happens to be, uh, starts going bad. That said, you'll get a printhead error and you have to install a new printhead, okay? Whether the other eight or 12 or 11 or 2,000, I don't care. Yeah, you know what I mean. If the other 11 are still okay, if one or two are bad on one other channel and you don't have any more nozzles to replace those, that's the end of the printhead. How long does it take to do that? Well, like I said, the more you print, the faster this, this happens. So you might say, well, hell, I won't print so much anymore. Well, then you'll waste a lot of ink, okay? That's it. You will be wasting more ink than you put on paper. It's that the ratio will be incredibly against you, okay? The people who print a lot, the ratio of ink on paper might be 10 to 1. You use mostly all of your ink to create prints. I hope you're selling them. If you're just printing for fun, yeah, this might not be the type of printer you want to use for your hobby work because you're just going to be spending money. You're just going to be spending money. And that's, that's the catch-22 situation with these printers. Yeah, they're wonderful. They put out outstanding work. I mean, they... The output is gorgeous, what can I say? But again, you have these properties that basically at the end of the day, at some point you're going to have to replace a printhead. The large floor units, the older IPF 6400 series, every two and a half years, that was two printheads, about five, $600 each, every two and a half years. That was part of the maintenance required. You know, you just did it but you were producing work for money. So you were able to amortize that, you know, absorb that cost. Uh, when you when you file your taxes, you're able to say, well, I had an expense of, you know, this and that. So, but if you're just printing at home for fun, it really makes no sense to buy something like that. You see what I mean? I know that now all your, all your Pro 1000 users out there are going like, oh, shoot. I almost said the other word. Oh shoot, Jose! Jose just just ruined my day, my night, 
for me, but I'm just telling you the actual factual truth. Let me read you, and then we'll jump over to Facebook because I want to share, um, yeah, some information for you guys. So this is what I used for my <clears throat> video on this subject. Let me uncurl this. I'm going to go ahead and close my calculator. I don't need it anymore. We'll go ahead and close that up. All righty. We're going to set up. Uh, I think I had. No, that's not what I want. Hang on a second, you guys. I'm using my little monitor here that's connected via um, HDMI. Yeah, that's what I want. Gosh, I can't even find it now. Here we go. Okay. Let me get my Facebook up. There we go. All right. I'm going to go ahead and read some of this first, okay, for you guys. And this is this is quite an eye-opener. So this gentleman has had a Pro 1000. Again, this is his second one. And he stays a Pro 1000 inkways is shocking. And again, this is what I keep telling you. It's going to shock you because you don't realize what's happening. You don't realize the... The why is why does it do this? Okay, you think it's just against you. It's, it's a conspiracy by canon. Yeah, no, it's not. If if the old HP printheads did this, they would last a lot longer without having to have uh, so many problems with clogged nozzles. Okay, that's just a simple fact. So first, let me qualify a few things. I'm a hobbyist. I don't print that often, and I have been in the printing funk. So there was a long time between prints. Same here. Got to remember, I don't do a lot of personal printing. If I do print something, it's going to be for you guys. Benefit, something to demonstrate something with a particular printer, ink combination, profile, whatever. So I'm going to be printing only when I need to print. So... Again, I will be suffering the consequences. What I preach is going to hit me back. All right. I am on my second Pro 1000 because I complained so much about the first one, wasting ink. There really was no change. And, of course, that's I could have told them that. I could have told them that. I record my ink per print. Wow, that's more than... I, I don't even do that. And total ink consumed when I print. For reasons too long to get into here, I believe the total ink numbers in the accounting software are inflated. So for those of you who do not know what the accounting manager, as it is called, is, it's a piece of software you can download. When you, when you are up in the Canon support page that where you get drivers, and that sort of thing in software, you can download the accounting manager. Now, you, it only works with a Pro 1000, 2000 and higher, and some of the IPF type printers. Not your Pro 10 or Pro 1 or Pro 100. Um, and so the actual number is approximately two thirds of what is recorded or reported. So, I will use that number, 195 versus 296. Okay, so ML, that is. With that said, let's get started. So he's talking about a six-month period. And during that time, I had two major automatic cleaning cycles and one nozzle cleaning cycle. Well, I don't know what that means, okay? They're all cleaning cycles. There, There is no nozzle cleaning cycle or automated cleaning cycle they're just cleaning cycle whatever triggers it that's irrelevant they all perform the same set of actions 
sucking ink out of the printhead and then sucking it out of the perch pad into the internal waste ink cartridge. That's it. It's the same process regardless. I printed only 32 prints in six months. I put a total of 34.52 ml of ink on paper. Many exclamation points. We're going to go over to the Facebook um, thread where all of this sat. And we'll take a look at some of the comments. I used 195 milliliters of ink. So this is going back to what he thinks that the um, actual true number is. The accounting software said 296, but he says no. It's 195. I don't know how he determined that number, okay? That means I wasted, he just did the math, right? 160.48 mLs of ink, or 4.6 times as much as I put on paper. You see what I mean, guys and gals? That ratio sucks. It should be the other way around. You should be using more ink than you put on the waste ink pads or the waste ink cartridge. These numbers are consistent, maybe slightly better than my first Pro 1000, but are actually made much better by the five recent 17 by 22s and five letter size prints that I created in the past three days. Without those prints, my ratio of waste ink to paper would have been right at 7.5 times. This is closer to what I saw in my first Pro 1000. Welcome to the Canon Waste Ink Factory. I believe the only way to beat this issue is to print a lot, a lot, a lot, thereby averaging the waste down. This waste will be there whether you print a little or a lot. Duh. Yeah. So, you know, let me put this out of the way here. So, root awakening. Yeah, that's what that's what it is. Now. How does that apply to money? So someone else did contribute this. And yeah, I agree with it a certain extent. I think my numbers are a little bit different than the ones he is uh, talking about. But again, if that is what he experienced, then that is what he experienced. I did further calculation. This is someone. If you divide the cost of Canon Pro 1000, by the approximate estimated amount of 17 by 24 prints with a complete first set of cartridges. The results are the following. Cost of the printer, $1,300, divided by initial 65 17 by 24s. That equals $20 each. That's just amortizing the cost of the printer, of course. And $10 worth of ink per print. That's too high. Used with the execution of each print, including the cleaning cycle wasted ink, gives us a grand total of $30 per print. Yeah. Um, if you are using, if you are only printing an average of six, five to six prints a month for the first year, you are paying 50% more than if you were outsourcing your prints at $20. Uh, a pop, a true luxury indeed, considering the compromise and the required dedication involved. Well, you know what? Tough. That's the way it goes. That's the way it is. So if you're looking at it that way, then sure. Say you were only charging $30 for a you know 17 by 24 print. And it cost you, literally cost you. If you include the cost of the printer, like you said, $30 you're breaking even, you're not making any money. So you got to charge $50. But if you charge $50, maybe you don't have as much business as you would. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, in that case, it makes sense to have your work done by a private lab for $20. That way you can at least make $10 a print. Now, like I said, I don't agree with those numbers per se. But the fact of the matter is that you have to print Regardless, okay, you have to print. Otherwise, those ratios are always going to be against you. Okay, you're going to waste 
more ink on cleaning cycles. It's tricky, isn't it? Yeah. So what should I do? Well, either don't complain, accept all of this, and enjoy the hell out of that printer because it is an amazing piece of tech. It'll produce work that you never dreamed possible. The luxury aspect of it. Think about it this way. I have a Costco right up the road, not even three quarters of a mile. The biggest pain in the neck would be parking and get, you know getting in the store. But anyway, once I'm there, I can go over to the printing department and have them make me whatever print size I want. Okay, They have huge Epson printers there. And they charge a really reasonable amount for a print. And I can probably go eat a hot dog and come back and my job is done. And then I can tell them, hey, listen, can you change this or that? Yeah. Well, some places will charge you for that, you know, second attempt because they feel that they provided you with what you provided them. Okay. So that can be a bit of an inconvenience. Okay. So what do you choose to do? Well, you can always sit back at home and send your file to New York to some camera store that does printing and have them printed and then they have to ship it to you. It's gonna take about three days each each transaction and hopefully you will love what you get. But I had a gentleman come back to me and basically see at the beginning of that video I said if you are happy with your Pro 1000 or 2000, any of those families, and you know what you are getting into, you know what to expect and accept, then stop watching this video right now. Don't even bother. Please go watch another one of my videos, of course. Don't leave the channel, but you don't need to watch this video because this video is not for you. This video is for the ones who are thinking they may have a Pro 100 and they go, you know what? Gosh, I would love to make a 17 by 25 or with a new firmware 17 by 47 inches. Ah, I need to get a Pro 1000. Those are the people I'm targeting. You already know somewhat the way the Pro 100 behaves. They do the same thing. It's just not as you know acute as the Pro 1000 does because they use as dye inks. Dye inks don't develop that much residue. So you will probably not get these between batches of prints cleaning cycle that's then added to the timed cleaning cycles already. The time period for the Pro 10 is 120 hours. That's five whole days. You can print day one, get a cleaning cycle. Okay, fine. And just print, 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 print every day. And you will not have a cleaning cycle until 120 hours have passed. Then the next job, whatever length of time beyond that 120 hours. That's another thing that people don't get. The 20, 120 hours for the pros 100, that's the trigger point. After that, you can go to 150 hours. It'll still run the same cleaning cycle. It's not going to be a bigger one than it did, say, a day and a half ago. You have five days plus another almost five days after that. Okay, you see what I mean? After the 10 days, that's when it goes to the next level. Okay, so keep that in mind. If you have a Pro 100, you already know kind of like what the situation is. It's just that with the Pro 1000, it's like on steroids. Okay, so that's that's what the reason I did that video, just to kind of bring you guys to reality. And so you don't come back and, oh, you know, Bitch and moan. Yeah, that's the word about the behavior of this printer. It does it because it has to. It has to. It's a thermal printer. It has to clean itself because I won't do it. You guys probably won't do it either. You would not systematically do that. You only do it because we're reactive people. We only do it when we, uh oh, shoot, I'm getting some. Weird banding or missing colors. Oh, shoot. Let me check my nozzle check. 
Oh my God, I'm not printing on my yellow channel. I got to run a cleaning cycle. That's the only time we do it. So you will not experience that because the Pro 1000 cleans itself, whether you, I, she, he, they, whatever, likes it or not. They just do a, do that on their own. All right. So now that I've ticked you guys off, I hope not. I hope not. I hope this is, you know, going home to you and uh, hitting you, you know, where it has to. Let me go ahead and, oh, my voice is going away again. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to Facebook, guys. I'm going to put myself here in the corner so you can see my pretty face. Okay. So the problem is I'm so blind that I can't even see myself here. So Maeve J. Bell, Paul, sorry. Um, he's the guy that wrote that initial um, set of uh, comments. And we have 51 comments here. I suggest, because I'm not about to do this here, that you guys go back to my Facebook group. He's right on top right now. He's probably about the second comment down, the second thread. And take a look at this. It is extremely educational for you guys that have Pro 1000s, okay? I really recommend that you do that. So if you have time, either today or tomorrow, the name is Mabe, M-A-B-E, J. Hall. This guy is a record keeper. He he takes, I mean, meticulous notes about his Pro 1000s performance and what he's been doing. And so I highly, highly recommend that you guys do that. All right. So that is that. I don't want to get too heavy into that because I tell you, it'll, it'll drive you nuts. Let me go back to my self here. Let me see. Now, I'm going to go ahead and open up the floor to you guys for uh, questions. And I'm also going to throw this at you guys. If you have a camera like that one right there, let me touch it. Boom. And you have a microphone such as this, and they happen to be attached to your computer, I can have you join us live. If you're willing to do that, um, I was hoping that uh, Rusty Nelson was here tonight, but it doesn't seem to be. I don't see his name here because he owns a Pro 1000 and he actually has moved it from, I think, like California somewhere up to Philadelphia. He performed the actual move. He got it to re revive itself uh, miraculously. I think he didn't use it for like a whole year. So... Concerning that, and going back to my tirade about, you know, the balance that you have to keep because the only way you're going to save ink, literally, is to disconnect it and put it in a box and not use it. Then why did you get it? You see what I'm saying? The only way you're going to not use gasoline on your car is to keep it in your garage or your driveway. And lock the keys up you're never going to drive that car again you won't use any gas right but you're not going to enjoy that automobile anymore because it'll just be sitting there parked so the same thing applies to a printer if you don't want to use any ink plug unplug it put it back in a box put it in your closet put it in your basement somewhere don't use it then what's the point so these printers are meant to be used they're meant for you to use ink. That ink has to be used. And then you have to choose, well, what do I want to use my ink for? I want to make prints, right? Why, why would I not have a printer if I wasn't going to make prints? I mean, look. This is what a printer is for, to make prints. And, of course, I'm in a different situation here. I'm not making any money from these prints, okay? Indirectly, I'm making money, sure, through the you know the YouTube channel, but that has nothing to do with you know, specifically with these prints. This is only educational purposes. So 
you get this you get this printer I'm getting tongue tied here and you say well I'm over the honeymoon period already okay uh, I, I am over that honey yes you are beautiful honey you're wonderful and boy can you cook you know but you're costing me too much money so I gotta kind of put you on hold and that's what people initially start doing they don't realize that that's going to throw off that remember what babe was talking about that that ratio okay the ratio has to be at least one to one gosh that's still terrible but eh, not so bad so if you can produce prints and you're still wasting as much money as you it costs you to create a print you're wasting on a you know main, maintaining ma maintaining your printhead clean i hate that i still hate that you know I don't want to waste a dollar every time I use a dollar to make a print. You see, I want to I want to use ten dollars to make several prints and waste one dollar. See, now I got a ten to one or nine to one ratio. That's more favorable. And at the end of the day, I have ten prints to show you. You see, whereas the other way, if I just run nozzle checks, I got nothing to show you. Well, I'm going to have a get together with my friends and then we're going to share our nozzle check results. You know, I'm going to do a show and we're going to feature our nozzle checks. All right. Who's going to come to something like that? So let's talk about any problems, any suggestions, any comments you guys have. Put them right here in the chat. Please do so. Don't be shy. We're here to help each other out let me put this back over here and again like i said if you, any of you want to join the panel just say so i will put a link i'm going to put a link here in anyone who has either a phone that can handle this or again you have already installed a a um, microphone and camera to your computer so i'm going to go ahead and just continue on with the comments here then we're going to talk about refilling certain cartridges okay also someone asked they got into a huge discussion about proper way to harvest ink because one of the tricks to save money and maintain your quality and not have to switch over to a third-party source even if you're using refillable cartridges like some epson printers allow you to do so and canon printers allow you to refill their original cartridges the best way to go by the way if you have a source of oem ink in larger volumes because there are printers that use exactly the same ink as the one you're trying to refill then it's best to go with these larger cartridges you're not going to save a fortune, but you're going to save some money and you're going to maintain that top level quality. So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to, I got a bunch of stuff right here that I'm going to share with you guys. But let me go back and see who I missed. Okay, so. Okay, I think I left off with Glenn Goldstein and his G3200 Mega Tank. So that is a, a Canon printer, I believe, right? Uh, Precision Colors recently started to um, support those G Tank printers. He also stated, I'm getting great prints straight out without the Canon Pro software. I, you don't need to use that software. The Pro 100 needs the pro what oh the pro software to get decent color and density no not really i'll tell you what i don't even use it i don't use it whatsoever i find it unnecessary it has some pretty good layouts the professional the print pro the print what is a print studio pro uh for the pro 1000 is actually a higher level um software than the one for the lower printers and it does have some, uh, it has a separate layout utility that will allow you to uh, create better, more accurate layouts. In other words, 
paper and image positioning. Um, but as far as color management, sure, it does it automatically for you. But I suggest you learn the process yourself. It's like a lab tech nowadays out of school. They only learn to use the instruments that perform these blood gas tests or, or serology tests. They don't know how to do the assay by hand with you know test tubes and slides. They don't know how to do that. So if the machine breaks down, no more testing. You see what I mean? So learn the proper uh, workflow, if you will. Learn what an ICC profile is. Learn what it does. Learn how to use it manually. Learn not to rely on automatic type systems, okay? That I don't trust anyway. All righty. Sammy Castro. 13 says, one question is worth it. Make my printer chipless or stain with the brand ink? I think you're talking about um, staying with OEM or going with a um, third party choice. And you must be talking about the P800 because what other printer would be the one that's kind of locked out that would be photo based? Um, it depends, yeah. Um, if you don't mind spending $60 a cartridge every once in a while, then, yeah, you can stay with original cor cartridges, original inks. Uh, if not, you install the software. What it does, it allows you to then use refillable systems that would no longer be able to be used on the P800, except for just once. One time is all you get. And what happens is when the chip reaches empty on one of the eight cartridges or nine cartridges in the PA-100. Once you get to the point where one of those colors reaches empty, according to the chip, in a foreign PA-100, not, not a North American zone one, this would work. You would remove the cartridge, fill it to the top, put the plug back in, pop it back into the printer, and it would reset itself to the full level. And you could do that once every cartridge goes empty, you would perform that operation. Well, it doesn't happen in American or North American printers, PA hundreds. So what you would do, here's the, here's the um, strategy. You get the PA hundred. Yeah, you use your OEM colors until they're about half full. Remove them. Remember, we talked about this problem with the black ink switch locking yourself out, okay? So you remove those cartridges about, about half full. It's 50% level. Put them in a box and store them. You will need them at some point. You install the refillable cartridges, load it with the inks of your choice, and put it back in the printer. I'm using OEM inks. I buy my inks from large cartridges. I extract that ink, and I fill my refillable cartridges with it. I'm getting away with a lower cost overall, but I'm still 100% quality. So I pop it back in. All cartridges are, are recognized as full and full level and also genuine. But then when one reaches empty, that resetting process will not occur. So now my only two choices, one is about $60 and the other one's $400. $400 one involves a chipless, uh, a not a chipless, a what they call a decoder, a chip decoder board that is basically a, a, a circuit board that you wire internally to your printer. It hangs outside. It severs the communication from the printer to your actual chips on your cartridge. And then it just relies on the nine embedded chips that the board has. And it allows you to perform up to 30 full global resets, okay? Yeah, not individual colors, but global. So when one level reaches empty, you press the button and it resets that one up to full and the other ones back up to full, regardless of what you know level they were at. And of course, you better top off all your cartridges at that point. Make sure that they all are full so that they match whatever the chip is not reporting. The beauty about that is that they operate as normal cartridges with the chips 
the levels that are indicated will be shown to you just like OEM cartridges would. They drop gradually as you use ink. With the chipless solution, it does the opposite. It's always full, constantly. You never have a drop in ink level, but you do have a drop physically on ink on your cartridge. So you have to be constantly checking the actual amount of ink in each one of those nine cartridges and top them off as necessary and maintain that religiously. The same thing happens with the so-called uh, maintenance cartridge. Even though you're dumping ink into it, not as much as you do on a Canon printer, but you still do, those levels will always show as empty. And you think, oh, I got an eternally empty waste ink cartridge. No, you don't. It's going to overflow on you. Yeah, if you continue dumping ink into it. So at some time, you have to remove it, take the grill off the top, remove all that gunky, spongy material from the center, throw it in the garbage can, and then line it with something, whatever, paper towels, anything that will absorb ink, and then replace it. And it will still be seen as empty. So that's what the chipless software does. It costs about $60. It's not software, firmware. You better install it correctly, or you will brick your P800. Yes. And that will not make you feel very happy. Okay. But it works. Harold Goldberg from Richmond, Virginia. And we answer Sassy's question about the Pro 1000 waste. Yeah, it does. It does. It does use ink for maintenance purposes as much as a Pro 1000. Yes. We're not going to call it waste because it's being put to good use, right? Cleaning your print head. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Roger Jones says, so what does it mean when the when your printer leaks or floods your desk with ink from the back right corner of the printer? That means that your internal ink pads are overflowed, over flooded. That means that they reached uh, saturation level and now you have ink all over your table. That's what happens. Luckily, most printers will reach a maximum count, an electronic count that will brick your building, basically, your building. It will brick your printer, basically. It'll stop it from working any further. It'll just say that some parts in your printer have reached the you know end of their life, basically and you have to replace them. So that means a trip to the center to have it uh, serviced for you. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking that's what it may be. Uh, either that or you have a massive leak on your cartridges. I don't know. Um, it could be just about anything. So if you tell me what model, then maybe I could shed some light. But, um, you know, you have to be specific with the models. Every every printer reacts differently. So you got to give the the person who you're asking uh, a question from the model of the printer so that they can give you specific information about that model because it could be anything. Steel busting biker. Hey, Ruko. Oh, Ruko. All right. So sitting here checking your live stream. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad. Amos Canzoni, hello all, and Ted, Ted is here. He's from New Jersey. All righty. Preach, Jose, says Badger Tail. <laughs> I try, I try, my friends. Dennis Bader, there's nothing wrong with reviewing everything with, uh, about printing. New people arrive all the time. Yeah, I know. Um, one of my biggest peeves with some of the channels my wife watches is that they rehash stuff all that all the time and i said well why don't they just go back and you know look at the previous oh people just don't do that she said we don't do that we only look at the new new stuff and i go like then why do i bother i i think i hit gosh was it 1400 i don't even know how many videos 1400 something videos at this point and they're all in, in playlists, so you can just go back and look at my list of playlists and choose the subject, 
look inside there. Yeah, I know it takes time. It takes a little bit of work. Nobody wants to Google anything either anymore. So they'll come to me and ask me a question that I find on Google in about five seconds. Then I sort of sarcastically tell them, oh, I searched Google for about five seconds and this is what I found for you. Here's the link. Hey, makes me feel a little bit better at that point, especially if I've had a bad day. Okay, Stephen King, he says, uh, I just purchased a Pro 1000 and love the print so far. Thanks for all your commentary on ink use. Yeah, um, it is a hell of a printer. Let's talk about, I mean, let me see, how many more do we have here? And again, don't forget, just ask away. I just got a few more things I want to share with you guys. And, you know, even if we have to call it an early night, that's fine. Um, it's still bright outside. I want to get a couple of drone flights before the uh, weather turns south again tomorrow. Uh, let's see. But I want to make sure that I share what I plan to share with you guys. Steve King says, oh, wait a minute. I just missed somebody. Dennis Bader, should I leave the printer on its default setting for a cleaning cycle? and set your own, say, 30 hours. I don't understand what you mean. You can't do that. You cannot change those settings. Should you leave your printer on its default? Yeah, there's no way to... to that's, that's embedded into the firmware. You cannot change that. For a die-based printer, it's 120, 240, and 480. For a pigment-based printer, because it's more likely to create residue as it prints than a dye printer, then it's 60 hours, 120. So they they have it, and they cut it in half. You only have two and a half days of sort of free printing, if you will, before the previous clean cycle and the next clean cycle. So 60 hours pass, and you happen to print something, it's going to create a new cleaning cycle, Keep your printhead nice and clean for you. Your print will be flawless. You'll go, yay, look at this, mama, and show your print. And she'll go, wow, that's gorgeous. You're not going to complain about that cleaning cycle. Now, had it not done that cleaning cycle and you had stripes on your print, then you would and complain about it. I know that was sarcastic, but it's true. They do that cleaning cycle for Oh, my own good, and I'm the worst one, and everyone else is good. It does that. It has to. It cannot afford to, to do something that's going to harm itself. And believe it, you don't want to increase the rate of self-destruction that thermal printheads go through on a daily basis as you use them. A lab that produces constant prints, they're changing that printhead maybe every year and a half. That's the way it is. That's part of the cost. Butch Owens. Sorry, better late than never. Okay. We'll read the chat notes. Saeed is here with us. Uh, are you staying home and doing fine? Yeah, we're fine. Uh, today we went out and uh, what did we do? We did a couple of things. We um, went to the post office. Uh, let's see, wait a minute. Oh, no, no, that was yesterday. See, losing track of time. Um, yesterday, we went to the post office, went to the supermarket to Safeway, bought some essentials, bologna, pastries and goodies, that type of thing. And the paper aisle was empty, total, um, devoid of any products. And But anyway, we, we did fine, and uh, a lot of people were wearing masks. We were just staying away from folks. We all feel very well. We're um, relatively healthy, if you will. Um, and then what did we do afterwards? We went to the, the CVS, to the pharmacy, and bought some uh, kinesiology tape for my wife's arm. I tape her up every day or two, and um, she has a problem with her uh, shoulder. And then we came home. That's it. And then I made a video and relaxed and watched some TV and 
flew my drone a little bit. And um, one of my drones, I have too many now. But anyway, so yeah, we've been we've been um, staying safe. Today we went and fed somebody who um, we have a friend who's a special needs person. He's in his seventies and uh, he lives in a in a um, like a housing system where it's for people with needs. And so we brought him some lasagna and a salad and a piece of apple pie. And I sat with him a little bit and um, had a good time. And then I told him that next Saturday. I'm going to come knocking at his door. We're going to go to the parking lot and fly my helicopter. That's what I call the drone for him. Um, he's um, somewhat bipolar, and uh, he also has some physical disabilities. But he's a nice guy. So what can I say? Ah, Rusty Nelson is here. So let's go ahead and invite him in. What's up, big man? How's it going, Jose? Man, I just, hey, I'm doing good. I just saw a video today about a um, what is it called? The unexplained is with um, William Shatner. I don't know if you've seen that show. They no, it was about a pro one thousand. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Ew. about tornadoes, storm chasers. Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah. Get started and, in that uh, soon. Yeah, they have Machio. Um, uh, what's his name? The um, Japanese uh, astrophysicist um, Machio. Kuko or something like that. Anyway, he's the guy is a genius. And they were talking about um, people like you that go chasing storms. And yeah. tornado it started in that so unpredictable that they even the best scientists cannot predict how a tornado behaves. They showed an aerial photograph of a house that was surrounded by woods. The tornado went one way, it missed, it went toward the house. It went around the house. It went to the back. It made a 180, came back down, missed the house again, and destroyed every tree around that area was down. It's like a nuclear explosion. Yeah, there's and many the house times was left intact. When when we get out there and uh, you'll see one side of the street is yeah. completely intact and the other is you know a mess, and you know you just feel so sorry for the people when when you drive through oh, yeah. these neighborhoods. But um, so, yeah, my, we were talking about the Pro 1000. So since you're the instigator that got me hooked on the <laughs> 1000, yeah, it's your fault. Yeah, uh, I thought that Sorry. I was waiting for you to come on board. We've been talking about just everything about it. I mean, all of the. Uh, so how do you handle how, how you've been able to handle the fact that the Pro 1000 performs all of these clean cycles? Now, I have one. Dirty used cartridge here. This weighs, what did I say, guys? Uh, 460 something grams. Whereas the brand new one that I have in a box right here weighed in at 277 point something. So I called it 278. So we, de we did the math, figured out how much ink is in here. But I've had people tell me that their results vary rather greatly between cartridges. When they're declared full and the printer says, hey, sucker, change my cartridge. I'm done. Mm -hmm. you, I, I'm not going to let you print anymore until you change my diaper. So yeah. they That's have about what it is in there. They, they are this, they're reporting like 50 gram difference in some cases. It's not that I could I could understand 10, 12 gram difference, but not 50. Well, How many have you gone through? Well, I. You know, you, I, I just caught, it was kind of funny because I was, I was driving back with my girlfriend. We were out trying to get our exercise in. And um, I heard you talking about that video that I have on my on the YouTube channel about where I left it sit for an extremely mm -hmm. long time. Not only let it sit, but it was in a, um, you know, your basic storage type thing, you know, out, mm -hmm. outside with no uh, climate control. And, you know, it would get up to 100 degrees in there. And I thought, sure. Man, this thing's never ever going to survive this you were baking that printer yeah and so i called up and my one of my buddies up at canon and he said you know he said you might as well just go for it and just you know put it back together and because you know I, you can see in the video where i did everything you were supposed to buy the book and i go through it step by step because i thought how many times do people do this and record it because you just don't do it that often 
Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a long time and put it back in, shook all the carts. And I probably had, I think it took like when you first started, it would tell you, you actually had to put in some new ink cartridges because you didn't have enough in there to do what it, the cycles that it had. But my buddy at Canon told me, he said, keep the old cartridges, put them in a bag and just shake them again before you use them and you'll be able to use them. No problem. And I did. I came back and I'm still plugging a couple of those old ones back in. Um, the maintenance cartridges, the I had two full ones. I kept all of them and I had two that were partway done and I've kept those. So I'm going to see whether I can plug those back in. Now, luckily, those are only 20 so bucks a piece or something that, like that. When you performed the emptying out of the printer, is that what you did? Yeah, I did. I did, did print the book, the transport. You know, we do the full transport. So how, do, how does it handle that? Does it do, does it allow you to remove the existing cartridges? Of yeah, ink? because yeah, because you know you can take like nodes. I think I'm trying to remember. I mean, it was two years ago, but mm -hmm. it was. Um, it tells you that if there's not enough ink in one of them, it's going to tell you to pull it and put a full ink cartridge in. So it's going to use up some of that ink, but that ink that you pulled out that maybe there's 25% left, mm -hmm. you can go right back in. And when that other yellow empties, you can put that back in. And I let mine sit for, well, you'll see in the video, it's like some yeah. of them are over 15 months. Some um, people have actually, around. I had a guy that told me he found a Pro 1000 for like a few hundred dollars. It was ridiculously low used. Uh, they checked the print count it was only like 200 sheets have been put through it hmm. and he was able to unplug it off the wall he did not perform that and he drove 110 miles he and his buddy brought it out nice and level put it in his car and he drove and he got it home he plugged it back in after he positioned it in his new area whatever and cranked it back up and it did a clean cycle did an also check, everything was fine. So he was able well, to transport it. I mean, not sideways, obviously, but he kept it nice and level and flat. Yeah, I, I mean, two things, like you, you, you talk, I, obviously you, you do a lot with refilling and stuff. And the only thing that I sometimes think about, I use it all OEM inks. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think about doing the, getting one of the larger cartridges from the 2000, 4000 series. And, you know, use an ink out of that, but I never do for the 1000. But, um, you know, I kind of have a philosophy about it might be a little bit different. I, I used to race exactly, exactly, because it is cheaper. There's no doubt about that. There, there's no doubt about that you save money. Um, this is, this is I don't 25. Yeah, I don't do I don't do this quote for a living, although I do make custom prints for some people very seldom. But um, this is a hobby and I kind of, people ask me about it and I say, it's, I used to race sailboats when I lived out in California and I had my own boat and you would spend all kinds of money on sails and blueprinting the bottom of the boat and feeding the right crew to keep them on board. And when you got all done, you would get a trophy and a t-shirt and something else. And I was racing guys that some of them were at the Olympic level. Mm -hmm. So but when you got all done, you had the best time in the world. It was a great hobby. You loved it. And as long as you could afford and you didn't put yourself into bankruptcy buying sales, you never look back. And I kind of look at that for myself. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong or, or, or whatever, but I don't print a ton. And I, I, I print what I call wall hangers only, you mm -hmm. know, something that I'm going to be, I'm going to put on a wall. Yeah, but to to get there, it may take me ten prints. You know, of you know, just I'm a pixel peeper, so dot peeker peeper. Um, you know, and I just like it perfect. And so for me, I kind of liken it to the sailboat racing. It's my hobby that I've taken up um, after I got out of the Hollywood thing, and I don't um, I, I don't go crazy and drive myself crazy of whether it costs me fifty cents or a dollar fifty. Um, I'm not saying that's right or wrong and it's not for everybody. Some of these, some people are in this for a business and they have, they have to know those numbers. Um, but I, you know, I use all OEM inks and 
Uh, people ask me what I use. I use Red River paper. Mm-hmm. Um, I do um, with Mike. I, I use uh, Q Image, uh, which it has been an absolute joy. Mm-hmm. Um, I've talked to him a few times, so I try. I stick to those things. Um, We're going to have Mike and Andrew, Q Image One guy. Yeah. On the on the live stream in the next week or so. Yeah. So that's really going to be dedicated to just for Q Image users and questions about Q Image what it does, what it can't do, what it can do, what it does better than anything else, all of those sort of things. And yeah, and I may go, I, I may go, I may go two or three weeks without printing. You yeah. Know, like I said, all my printers are Canons. I have a 9120, a 1000, and a 4000. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm in the gallery a few times a week, and I will use Q image. A lot of people say, oh, I just print a nozzle checker once in a while. I use their purge, what they call it a purge. Yeah, it's the unclog tool. Right, and it's great. Yeah. It prints out a nice pattern. Um, yeah. And and yeah. that's pretty much all that I use. Uh, you I do realize use- that pattern is not just any combination of light. Right. Yes. That has been engineered by Mike, okay? And it does the most amazing job in... Say you're running into a few nozzles that would not warrant a full cleaning cycle because you'll waste quite a bit of ink just to, you know, clear up a couple of little anomalies with a few nozzles. You just run that, and that does the job at a fraction of the ink you would have done, you would have used doing a full cleaning cycle. And as you all know, being a Pro 1000 and Pro... 4,000, I hate you, uh, <laughs> owner. I sold my boat to get that. <laughs> it, it, it is zoned, right? So yeah. you run only the zone that you require to clear a color from. In other words, if it's, if it's gray, then you just run, I think it's zone two, and that'll take care of, and it won't touch the other eight colors. So you're able to systematically choose a particular zone and just run a clean cycle to affect that one channel without wasting ink. It's not like a regular cleaning cycle. It'll just waste everyone, everyone okay. across the board. You can actually on, on a on a on a trigger clean cycle by the printer, it'll it'll use a global you know set of inks. Whereas if you do a manual clean cycle yourself, you can choose. But does that mean that you start that clock again? That I've never been able to figure out. You, you got me. You're, gonna, you're the one that I realized. On a manual clean cycle, well, <laughs> that set my clock back to zero. No one knows that. I really don't know that either. But I, I'm not going. I can't, Fred. I can't. Yeah. My mind will explode if I if I start thinking about that. And I, I listen to you. Um, you know, I, learned, I always wondered as I heard the different sounds start uh, when it would start up. Yeah, and then, uh, by listening to you, I said, "Oh, okay, yeah, now I know what that's." Yeah, going. Don't, don't print for two <laughs> weeks, and then all of a sudden print something. And at least in the Pro One Thousand, I can't say about the Four Thousand. That's more of a vertical type printer. Um, yeah, I will. You know, since we're trying to put out things, um, the, cartridges, I, the cartridges are are inserted vert- vertically, correct? What, what's that the, on the Four Thousand? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they drop down. Yeah. So you will hear you will hear that the rhythmic pumping action, and it actually changes the rhythm. On the Pro One Thousand is pa 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 and then faster. Yeah, those are the internal little pistons agitating that ink that has sitting for two weeks stagnant, and that will get you. There's a term for that in one of the printers. It says. One of the other printers, there's a there's a process that you run. Oh, do I have one here? Yeah. Pro 10 cartridges. They look really simple. Inside, there's a paddle. I don't know if you can. This has ink yeah. in it. It I has a, so. a little paddle that moves. So you can run uh, what they call it. They call it an ink quality something setting. It's really, it, it loses in the translation from Japanese to English. So what they mean is it's going to resuspend the pigment particles in that ink that's inside that bag. There's a bag 
a pleated bag that's been pressurized by an external metal diaphragm and that acts as a slight spring type action against that bag. And that maintains a certain amount of positive pressure. So if I take this clip off, I'm gonna lose my ink, okay? So that little paddle lives inside that bag. And as the printer moves back and forth, when it's running that ink quality process, it's moving that little paddle. It's just swaying like a little boat oar. And that is re-suspending the ink. So on the Pro 1000, it does it behind your back. You can't see it happening. So it's actually running a, a little two-way piston like this on each color. And that resuspend that that's the first thing. And you hear that noise and you go like, what the hell is that? What is it doing? Quickly print my image. Well, no, dude, you waited two weeks. So now it's got to do this. And then after that, it's going to run. It does something else where the print it literally just stays on the right side and just does this. Da -da. Da -da. I don't know what that is, to tell you the truth. When it goes over the parking station, it will sit there and it'll go silent. That's when the pump is actually sucking out ink. And then it detaches, moves to the left, and there's a puddle of ink on that on that ceramic, porous, rectangular, zoned spot, yeah. they call it. Then the pump begins to whirl, and that ink is drained into this. And it will perform that as long as it feels it needs to, so that when Rusty runs that nice, what size is your 4,000? 44, 44 inches. inches. 44 by God knows what. It will be perfect. Yeah, I, I think that yeah. it, it, we're, we're talking about not be angry at no. the <laughs> amount of ink that it used for that cleaning cycle because you just created a 44 by 70 something inch print. And you your ratio of ink wasted compared to the amount of ink put on paper will be more in your favor than what some of the other people that never use the Pro 1000. All they do is generate waste ink. That's all they do. Oh, I'm running a nozzle check every week. Oh, big deal. You know, big deal. Yeah, you're keeping it exercise, but really every nozzle check you generate, it will run a clean cycle before the nozzle check is even performed. You waste yeah. 10 times more ink. There's um, there, there's something else that interesting. I'm just trying to spill out things that have happened to me that are kind of weird. That um, After I did get back, um, I, I'm, as you know, I'm out in Philadelphia, just outside of Philadelphia now. Um, and after I got the, the gallery together and everything, and I set up the printer about a month afterwards, I got an error message. It said, I think it said error 7300 mm -hmm. or 7304 or something like that. Did you look that up to see what it was? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it said hardware. And then it said, I'm going to repeat what I can remember. It may not be exactly right, but I talked to tech support and called up one of my buddies and then talked to tech support again. And it said hardware error, but that's all it said. Yeah, they're very right. And one thing that they told me to do was to unplug it and pl don't plug it back in and press the on off button 10 times. And what that does is release anything that's in the capacitors or anything like that um, and then allows it to kind of reset itself. But what I did that finally cleared it was I took every single one of the cartridges out and any one that was slightly low, um, I replaced with a new one, put them back in after shaking them a little bit and it's worked fine ever since. Mm -hmm. So um, I've, I've heard of some people getting some cartridges stuck in there and yeah. uh, one woman I was writing to, I said, well, did you try pulling the cartridge next to it out? She goes, no, I never thought of that. I said, well, pull the cartridges out from around it because they're, you know, they're kind of hard to get to if they're yeah, all I've in seen, there. I've seen videos about that and the carrier that holds the cartridge sometimes gets jammed. Yeah. yeah and I think somebody I saw also in some research saw a piece broke. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's kind of my philosophy for me for me and everybody's different is um this is it's I, I liken it to the sailboat racing and um you know I, I i know i've spent money on it and i love doing it i love trying to get the best print i can uh, you know and, and and it's just it's just a love 
you know, and it's it's yeah. driving me crazy. I'm I'm doing it, a test between a hobby like boating is that what do you have to show for it besides the boat? Well, the experiences that you had. Yes. It, but it's not something tangible like a nice print. So yeah, I, you, why I do, do you huh? People ask me, why do you print? Dude, are you kidding me? Look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, it's even it's even more fun taking it out of the business realm is I, I used to have people that would come into my house out in, uh, in, in, out in California and, you know, you'd have a party or people over and you'd see somebody look at something about four or five times. And I go, I said, do you like that? And they say, oh, it's gorgeous. I really love it. I said, well, that's yours. Take it home. Yeah. And that was the best part of printing for me. If somebody liked something I did that much, um, you know, I was happy to give it to them. I kept the frame, of course. I gave him the print. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, I gave him. Yeah. But you know, that's a big part of it. And then also, I do um, talks around the country on storm chasing to different photography clubs, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's it's really fun to help people out. And I understand why you do this because it's fun. It's fun to help people out and have them achieve something also. So yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's great. And I appreciate you doing this. This is a lot of fun. The Facebook group, I get a lot of, and people get upset sometimes about people posting their personal work. And, you know, that's what the group is for, is to show off what you have learned, what you've been able to achieve. And look, this is what I just did on my Pro 10. And it blows your mind. But some people are always going to be bitching and complaining about somebody posting about their work. So what? That's, yeah. that's the whole goal. Um, when you were talking about boating, that reminded me of here in Annapolis, Maryland. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. No, and it's like it's racing capital of the world. Annapolis, but you know, by the by the old state building and all, all of that. There's a big mooring area because you have two big rivers joining, and so people come in and bring their boats, and they have them moored there. It's a great little, um, like a, like a wharf, and we used to go a lot there and just walk around. Most of the time, you see people on their boats, maintenance, cleaning, mopping. They go there. Their boat is not even going out. They just go there to hang on their boat, and they don't take it out because it costs too much money to get there. Yeah. Uh, trust you know, me, I trust me, I understand. They have this three hundred thousand dollar boat in. They can't afford to, you know. So that basically reminds me of owning a printer, a Pro One Thousand. Yeah. You know, you just, I can't. Um, I can't see the chat. I'm not like I said. I'm not on my normal yeah, you computer can't see it because you're on. I don't know whether anybody has any questions or anything like yeah, that. Or, go ahead. Um, people that are watching right now, Rusty. Like I said, he's the one that um, responsible for me buying a Pro One Thousand. I, saw well, I, I want you to know, just, just so I, you know, you're responsible for me buying a drone now. So it's there you go. It's By the way, play. bad news about that Evo 2 is going to be delayed even more. I, I know. Yeah. I, I watch uh, a guy named um, Ken. His, his channel's name is Original Dobo, D-O-B-O. -O. He, he has connections with Altel. And so mm -hmm. he knows the inside. He's not able to fully release all of the information that's been given to him. But I just recently saw a video where yeah, it's going to be maybe June. So yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, right, there's a reason for everything. So anyone here who has any Pro One Thousand questions? Again, I've only been using it a little bit less than than my friend here, Rusty, has. Or just in here. general, you know, yeah, so, philosophy stuff's great ask away and i will go ahead and what i will do is this for instance uh pro 1000 question right here that's a question this is what i will do and you can see that right uh yeah okay so there you go can i say yes. can remove and replace the ink cartridges periodically to agitate them of course but it's not really necessary with the um, pro 1000 it does internal agitation anyway so but yeah, if, I, if it makes you feel better, go for it. You know. Yeah, I, I often think about that if I've left it sit because I have to be honest with you, I I have 
many times let mine sit for three weeks. And I sit there and I'm going, yeah, maybe I should just pull them out, agitate them because uh, my friends over at Canon told me, I said, yeah, there's no problem I pulling those out and putting them back in. Yeah, I haven't agitated mine since the beginning. Yeah. Right now, all the ones that are loaded on there, I've refilled one time. Uh, some of them I've refilled two times and they're running on single use chips. They are, you know, seen as genuine. I'm using this ink on it. I'm only using OEM ink. I'm using OEM ink on it. And so quality is still, you know, full OEM levels. And with any other printer, maybe, okay? But also be aware that anything that rides on the printhead and moves along as you're printing is being agitated anyway. So it's not necessary to do that. Only, only and I'll use this as an example. Now, this Epson cartridge, yeah, you need to agitate these. There's no internal agitation for Epson printers. It will not do that for you. Yeah, we're, we're talking about pig, pigment inks, too. Yeah, pigment inks. Trying, trying to get the, the, the pigment uh, resuspended in the... People ask about the Pro 100. Well, no, there's no point. First of all, it's just molecules in a, in a liquid media. There's nothing to settle. So dye inks don't require agitation. Plus these sponges, there's no point. <laughs> there's no point. You cannot agitate ink that's locked in a sponge. So just don't worry about that. Just let them write on the printhead as you print and you'll be fine. Let's see if anything else is here. Ah, are you familiar with the P6000, Rusty? No. That's the Epson. No. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm purely uh I'm a and, and for no I, I I'll tell you what, you know, it's kind of interesting when I went to go buy a printer, I don't know, five years ago when I first started to get in, into it, I knew that I wasn't going to be printing all the time. Mm -hmm. And just in my brain, nothing more than just trying to go through the process. Um I, I just had heard at the time now, you know, the, the thousand series hadn't come out. I think it was the 6300 or whatever the image programs were. They were on the 6343 or whatever it was series. And um, I just, everybody I talked to seemed to have problems with the Epson. And the idea that even if the printer went dead, I could go grab a new head and throw it in one of the Canon printers. Right. Um, that's the reason I yeah. went the you Canon. Mentioned, yeah, you mentioned 6300. I only, I only know the 6400 series, 6450 as well. Um, about every two and a half years, that's when you change the print heads on it. Yeah. So, you know, you got to remember these print, print heads are self-destructing themselves. They are wearing themselves out. Uh, he asked right here, are there, are there redundant nozzles in the Pro 100? No, not on that printer. It's just too low. Uh, Pro 1000, higher I, ipf printers will have print heads with redundant nozzles in other words extra unused ones that come into play automatically for you the the uh z3200 series from hp did the same thing and those those cartridges i mean those print heads had to also be replaced they're all thermal based as i said i think epson is the only company that has the patent on that pso crystal type cold firing print heads and so they make them yeah use or replaceable they will last forever if you take good care of an epson printer if yeah i don't the only, the only the only thing I, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, a guy by the name of mac Holbert. um him and graham nash and those guys way back when when uh, inkjet printing first started um they were the kind of the guys on the forefront of it that uh, kind of like the the george washington's of printing inkjet printing and i was talking to him about the pro 1000 and stuff like that and he says yeah it's great and it's great that you know the nozzles right in the middle of a print when if one farts out on you it'll take over and and use another nozzle but they found that if they do it on long runs for those guys that are doing you know 100 prints or something like that one right after another that if one goes out after a long run, it won't stop in the middle of the run. Even if the final one goes bad, it'll keep firing away and you'll start to see some streaks. Yeah. I think there's a there's a um, 
sort of like a happy period there where it'll allow you to finish. Now, the problem is on a 12 channel print hit, like the our printers use, when one of them wears out to the point where there's no more nozzles to replace it, that's it. I don't care what the other 11 health wise were like, <laughs> it's done. You got to replace the print head. Yeah. These cartridges here, tri color, there are three little compartments inside one for magenta, yellow, and cyan. Okay. When these cartridges run out of ink on one of those sponges, there's little sponges inside here as well. That's it. It doesn't matter how much ink was left in the other two compartments. It's done. I'm empty. No, you're not. Liar. You still have ink in the yellow and cyan. You just ran out of magenta. The same thing. If the magenta printhead, there's a built-in printhead right there. When that cannot explode little droplets of ink anymore, it's done. It doesn't matter what the other three channels were like. Uh, you have to replace it. And that's the way it is with thermal you know, type printheads. That's part of the cost. But again, like you said, you can just, as long as the mechanical aspects of the printer are still sound, you can just replace those printheads instead of buying a new printer. You know, So for 500 bucks, you replace the for 1,000 printhead. You're done. You can always replace these for 20 bucks each. Yeah. They look <laughs> really expensive, don't they? They look like really sophisticated pieces of tech. And the Chinese even have chips. Now, why would you want to replace that chip so you can continue to dump ink in here? And at some point, like someone earlier posted, their printer is overflowing gunky ink from one of the sides. Well, guess what? Your internal ink pads are flooding. And somehow your printer was not able to register it. Maybe, maybe they use some sort of hardware or software to allow them to reset the count. See, Canon printers used to allow you to do that. You can reset that, that waste ink level count and continue to fill those pads for printers that had internal pads. And at some point, you're going to overflow. You're going to overflow. So... That may be what's happening. Anyway, what will happen to that waste in cartage? I, I love that. A lot of people spell it that way. Yeah, that's it. It gets thrown away. <laughs> Sorry. There's no way that you can take this apart. It is welded together. It's a unibody type construction. The ones for your printer, however, uh, Rusty, you can take those apart. Have you have you looked into that? You talking about the 4,000? Yeah. No, I haven't. I haven't played with that's that one yet. Different, that's a different style, and it it can be screwed apart, and the insides can be removed, and you can actually get chips for these. Now, I don't know what they sell for. I think yours are a lot more expensive. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to be honest with you. I don't remember to tell you the truth. Yeah, the I, same thing for the two thousand. They're about like ninety dollars instead of twenty dollars. Yeah, and I don't know whether they hold a lot more ink. They have a lot more capacity for waste. Do you know what the capacity for your Pro 1000? Yeah. No, when I, I, I got it. When I did the fill thing to, to leave, when I did the transport, went through the transport thing, um, I kept the old cartridges. I wanted to see whether I could throw them back in a year or two later. I know it sounds weird and why I would do that, I have no idea. But I was wondering whether they would dry out a little bit and shove them back in or evaporate. I don't know. So... They're sitting, they'll probably sit there for another year and I'm going to try them again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, I'm just curious to see if the next family has a much larger capacity cartridge. Oh, no. I, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I'll look it up. I'll I'll figure it out and have you an answer by the next one of these. <laughs> Let's see who else. Okay. No, 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 no. Can I safely remove them? Oh, here we go. Okay, no. The answer was yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Are cartridges agitated or just the internal reservoir? The cartridges don't move. Okay. Pro 1000 cartridges, they just stay stuck. That's it. It's happening downstream. The, the reservoirs, I really don't know where they live. But when you open up the top of the printer, you're going to see some ink lines, a set of 
two bands with six lines each. I think that's coming from the compartments directly into the printheads. And the printheads internally, I've actually opened the Pro 1000 printhead apart. And again, it's just a set of 12 little dampers. They look like little cartridges. They look like this, but small ones without sponges. And that's what actually is receiving the ink. And then that feeds it to each channel, each nozzle set of channels, each set of nozzles, I mean. So you got like two compartments. The the one that's vented to the atmosphere. And by the way, Rusty, that's the reason you cannot tilt those printers. Because the internal compartments are vented. They're vented to the outside atmosphere. And they will leak if you exceed a certain angle. So yeah, I think it's 30 degrees or something. Why, why would they do that? Well, think about it. If air gets into an Epson printer's ink lines, you have to perform a complete ink recharge to push out that air. Cleaning cycles don't do shit, okay? They will not do anything. They, the bubble just stays there. And so only an ink recharge, and you need an adjustment program to be able to access that kind of utility. To It's like reloading your ink system again from fresh. You start with a dry cartridge, and um, you start with a dry printer, nothing in the ink lines, and you flood it with ink. Well, if you have a big batch of air in there, you have to do that whole process again. But on the Pro 1000, it's impossible to do that. You know why? If air gets in from your cartridge, people that disable ink monitoring on purpose after one cartridge is empty, and they want to squeeze out more prints, what's inside here? Air. At that point, this actually goes empty. When yeah. the air empty, it is empty. And you have nothing but air. That air will be vented inside that internal compartment. At some point, a sensor will stop you. There's a sensor that will say that compartment, just like a toilet tank, if it drops a speed below a certain level, water starts flowing in again to fill it. If the compartment drops be below a certain level, it expects ink to be available here to refill that space. No more ink is available. It will stop printing on you. Okay. It's smart. That way, ink never ink never drops below a certain level in that internal compartment. Isn't that amazing? And, yeah. we, still, and we still complain about the Pro 1000. Come on. It, the, I, the <laughs> level of tech in there is just ridiculous. So, so here's a question, a discussion thing. I, I hate to stick on one subject, but I'm not 100% sure of this, and I'm going to have to go look at if those cartridges, you know, you know, when we fill those cartridges with, they tell you to shake them a few times and then put them in, right? So that suspends the um, pigment in there. And so if it sits there for two months, like, I have done some, sometimes, but I'm out storm chasing. I got no choice until now that I have Q image. Um, so how I wonder how long they can sit there like that before they need to be resuspended in, in the liquid. I don't know. The, the, according to the labs, those particles, especially, I don't know about Canon, but Epson uses what they call macro, micro resin encapsulation where each little particle has ground I mean, to nanometers diameter, I mean, pretty accurately done. Yeah. They're resuspended. And the media that the particles surrounded by the little glob of resin, the, what do they call it? Not the, the relative density or whatever, it allows those particles to be neutrally buoyant as much as possible. Now, there could mm. be some settling, yeah. but they just kind of float and stay there. It's not going to be, you know, like sand inside a bottle of water. I mean, yeah, no, they stay pretty much buoyant. And so, sure, it doesn't hurt to take them out every six months. And so, so I got a question: Do yeah. you do do you do uh, custom profiles for people? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I I didn't know. I I I do them for myself, but I was just wondering if you do them. Yeah, I got me this toy right here. Yep, same one I got. So that that I got a bunch of um, 
I got a big job right here I got to do for someone. So I'll tackle that tomorrow, probably. Yeah, I'll tell you what, for people, uh, people out there, it definitely makes a difference to have it custom made for your setup. I mean, there's no. Yeah. Um, did, you, did you do your internal calibration on your printers? Yes. Yes, yeah. I do. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm starting to put together a little thing right now. I'm not 100% sure how I'm going to do it, but I'm kind of grading those types of things and how much of a difference they make. In other words, like calibrating your monitor would be A. I mean, mm -hmm. that's like a really important thing. And then, as you know, each one makes a little difference. But, you know, those calibration things are big. The, and, and the thing is, calibrating for the cannons, there's a certain process that's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to understand of doing those calibrations for the media types um, of how they layer themselves and they're divided into two different subsets also. So it gets mm -hmm. kind of funky and you almost have to keep track of what you're doing. Fortunately, it's not like the A level, like calibrating your monitor. If, to me, if you don't calibrate your monitor, you can't complain about anything. Right. Because it's such a big deal. Um, but I, I guess the reason for me bringing up the, the calibration that you do for folks is I've noticed even in myself, um, and Red River puts out, you know, after uh, talking to Drew a little bit, um, they do some really good calibrations for their, their their papers. But even I, you know, I can notice a difference when I do my own um, uh, for myself, which would be the same as you doing it for somebody if they sent you the prints. Um, it can make a difference. Um, and that especially goes for, I've noticed, if you if you uh, do you have color think by any chance where you can look at uh, the profiles and stuff? No, I, I I don't do that anymore. I used to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. I I do it probably because I do the talks, you know. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that you can look and see what um, how they programmed or what they use to do their color calibration in there. A lot of times it's listed right on the, on with the profile itself. And you'd be surprised of where some of these, these uh, companies, big name company, paper companies, camera companies get their profiles from. And it's from equipment that's nowhere near as good as what you have. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was amazed. So it can really make a difference. Uh, some of them are older. Some of them the wrong yeah, version. The thing that I like to do is when I make a profile, in, for example, if I'm using, whether I'm using OEM inks on my printers or not, or whether I'm using Precision Colors Signature Edition on my, yeah. my Pro 100 or whatever. So when I was doing this series, I, I, I got those inks from Mike. And I thought, okay, here we go again. Another update. And he's been working on this for like nine months. Uh, he was, hasn't been satisfied for eight and a half months with the results. And finally, he says, well, I've gone as far as I can go. I'm going to release it, but I'm going to let you test the first batch. So he sends me these, you know, eight bottles. And I happen to have extra cartridges. So I loaded one set with his new inks. And then I said, oh, man, I'm going to have to use my one and only set of OEM cartridges brand spanking new so i put those back in my printer i had another set in my pro 100 with the earlier inks and removed those put the oem ran two wasteful cleaning cycles just to make sure that i was pushing out all the old pc inks and i made a set of print let me get a couple of these okay so a beta fish all right yeah very, very bright, colorful, nice saturated prints. Pro one, Pro one hundred. Oh, this is crappy lighting. Let me see. Let me make myself big. If I can do that, here we go. All right, now you should be able to see it, Rusty. Yeah. All right, so you can see that, right? Yeah. I'll put it this way. I'll put it this way. And so this were one of them was done with OEM, and one of them was done with the. For 100 and those new magic inks, which I had no faith on, by the way, from the very beginning. 
So let's go back to both of us. So the idea when he was working on this project, and he could have just very well just, you know, hung on to what he had. But people were complaining that because a lot of people don't, don't do the change correctly. They will do it haphazardly instead of having an extra set that's been flushed and dried and you fill it up with the new product and you do a complete swap. They'll do it gradually. And so if any inks, any particular color has a problem, it's not going to get along with the other seven. <laughs> you see what I mean? So yeah. you start yeah. seeing all of these gradual changes and you don't know what the hell's going on because every day is a different story. So he wanted to come up with something that would be totally seamless. So when you decide to whether, you know, want to change the whole thing at once or just one cartridge at a time, that you would not see the difference. So which is which? Hey, you got me. Yeah. That, that's what I said, too. This is OEM. Yeah. And 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 red can be a tough color too. Yeah, and this is this is PC. So once I saw that, I thought, holy, you know what? And I thought, hmm, maybe I should do some more. So of course, originally I just did the standard image, and I actually like his rendition better than what the OEM was producing. And so I made all of these prints and I put them out on a table. I had people look at them and they didn't see the, the, the marking in the back. And like eight out of 10 picked the PC print. So people are, I did this with just the driver. Told the driver to use Pro Luster yeah. paper. I set my match color matching to ICM or what they call driver matching. That does an automatic link to the ICC profile that lives in my hard drive. I don't know what it's like on Mac, but that's the way it works with Windows. So you, I'm Windows. Yeah, you just okay. So you tell um the driver, hey, I'm gonna use Pro Luster paper. It will link to that ICC profile and basically give you a color managed print. Perfect using the driver. So I told you know, then I did a calibration. Again, I did a, a second calibration for the paper, Pro Luster using the, the Pro 1000. And I jumped over to the Pro 1000. I did that same print, and it came out identical. Wow. Yeah, so that told me, holy crap, this is pretty good. This is pretty good because people can now switch over at an eighth of the cost of OEM, produce prints that may not last as long. Of course not. But color-wise are pretty good ridiculously close probably gonna last longer than we will exactly um <laughs> and then i decided to do something a little bit more because you know saturated colors sure shit any any ink can do that just about so i did this image right here let me let me jump over to me for so you see that woman yeah. back in and the background is nothing but graffiti. And she's practically monochrome, almost. This is a very subtle, not saturated at all. And let's see. OEM is the bottom one. PC is the top one right here. OEM, PC. So I thought, okay, I'm sold. That's it. What else do I have to complain about? Nothing. So that's been my experience. And then I did probably one of the most demanding images. Blues and purples are a bitch to print, okay, to reproduce. Something like that. You see those? That's an engine. It's upside down. <laughs> there you go. Look at that. Show car, right? Yeah. Which is which? Yeah, well, I have no idea. Yeah, you really <laughs> you put this on a tabletop with better lighting than I have here, and just people just cannot tell. The top one is OEM, the bottom one is PC. So to be able to reproduce those purples and blues, 
those will yeah. be totally out of gamut. If you do a gamut warning on that image, it comes up as gray in most of those areas. Yeah. Meaning that, you know, hey, most printers cannot reproduce this. Don't even bother. Reduce the saturation so it'll be able to be, you know, no. So I ha I didn't have to do any of that. Um, whatever OEM produced, I was able to duplicate it again at an eighth of the cost. Because it costs, when you refill one of these cartridges, this is what people don't get. Let me show you. So you don't wait until this cartridge is empty. You hit it as soon as it reaches almost low. There's a little optical prism at the bottom of this little chamber here. And it detects that the prism is being exposed to air. So there's a beam of light being shown constantly through that prism. This is not a uh, cheaply engineered cartridge, by the way. Yeah. But that beam passes through that prism. If there's liquid on top of the prism, it doesn't divert the, the beam of light. But once air is exposed, it changes angle. Low warning immediately. It knows. So before that happens, you take it out, you reset it, and you top this off. That way this sponge is constantly being kept at the proper saturation level so that it keeps on feeding ink as the printer expects to receive. So you cannot reduce that ink flow by waiting until this is already half yeah. dry. In other words, you let this go empty, and now you have no more ink to replenish that sponge. You're creating a deficit here every time you squeeze. One last, I just want to print one more. No, don't do that. At the minute, just before low, take it out, res reset it, and top it off. It how much ink do you think I can put here? In that little that little space right. Look how small that is. I no seven, idea. seven milliliters of ink, that's all. Really? Yeah, that comes out to 75 cents a refill. Wow. 75 cents a refill. Huh. As opposed to fifteen dollars. Wait a minute! I said one eighth. That's a lot more, better than one eighth, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So I'm wrong. Well, it's now don't see now you're gonna get me started on that to convert my Pro One Thousand over. So yeah, so be able to print stuff like that. All you need to do is use the right kind of ink. Period. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Listen, I gotta yeah. discuss some refilling stuff. So and I got it. I got I'm being called for dinner, which is okay. So go eat. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can keep these people a lot awake here so that I don't lose all of them. They're, the only yeah. thing about this uh, broadcast type software is I don't see how many people I have, I don't see the count, only uh, they can. They can see it because they're looking at it on YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah, it doesn't tell me how many people are on. You should should plug your phone in next next to you. I could do that, yeah. I, or yeah. yeah, I could make a little window here. But well, yeah. as always, I enjoyed talking to you, and hopefully, we'll talk about the. Yeah, uh, I will let everybody know. Oh, you were saying before you go, uh, calibrating your monitor. Yeah, that's number one. And then your, if you got a Pro One Thousand and higher, you can internally calibrate the printer so that it outputs as the factory intended it to do so. Right. But have you ever used one of these? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. To create yep. a camera lens profile. Yep. So that's, yep. to me, that's my first step. Monitor, printer, trifecta. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I, uh, I, I think I've covered the whole gamut of color. Um, also, micro -fo focusing uh, each lens, too, to the body. Yeah. Which is totally different. I'm, but I'm Mitch Boyer. Look him up. Mitch. Oh, no, no, I know who he is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Pro 4000. Yeah. He just recently did a video that I think everybody will be very glad to watch on calibration, internal calibration. Why? Yeah. Why you do that? How? All of that. What does it do? Yeah, and it's it's really, not only it's not only color, right. color. It's also has to do with the media that you're doing it oh, yeah. too. So it's. Uh, so he's gone from in a matter of a few weeks. He's gone from like 200 subscribers to over a thousand. So. That's good. He doesn't know that I've been promoting him. I'm not. I'm not going to tell him. I'm not going to tell him. I don't need to do that. I'm just glad that he's really doing well. He is. Uh, he specializes on one thing only: large prints, but not from a digital source, only from film scans.
Oh, wow. Yeah, and that's huh. what he does. And he yeah. leaves all the dust and everything alone. He will not mess around with, like, chemicals he to deposit little piece. Oh, it was a pain in the ass to keep a print, a processor clean because algae would build up in in these these chemicals literally and they would deposit themselves on the on the on the gelatin uh, emulsion and when you dry it they're there little marks here and there that you would yeah. be touch out no he just leaves them alone so he's yeah. kind of a purist i still like him he, he's, he's a nice guy all right no, I, yeah. always a pleasure sir yeah enjoy your dinner i will thanks a lot talk to you guys later yep Let me, all righty. So we are back now. As I said, I'm going to show you guys if you're still interested in seeing this. We got 40 people watching. Awesome. Thanks for letting me know. Um, that's Crypto Time Lord. Let me show you that here, right here. That's awesome. I cannot see the count unless I open up a uh, um, YouTube Windows. And it is so delayed that uh, it just confuses the living daylights out of me. So, let me go back and see if we have any questions from people. So this is what I can do from now on, week by week. I can have a guest come on. I'm going to have Mike uh, Cheney and also uh, Andrew. Andrew wrote the code to QImage1 for Mac. And so we'll have Andrew as well as Mike Cheney, who has been the the programmer for QImage since its beginning years ago. So I have not heard word from them yet, and uh, I plan to have them both on the panel. So once I make this announcement, make sure that you come on board because this is going to be a blockbuster. It's going to be fantastic. Let me make sure that I'm not going to repeat myself here. All right, yeah, the Pro 100 does not have any any redundant nozzles. It's just too low end of a printer. Um, the print head is, again, this type of print head. Most printers that have simple print heads like these where the cartridge is actually right on top and installed on top will not have redundant nozzles. As far as I know, I could be wrong, of course. And we looked at that one. And so let's see what else we got. Class action suit versus Canon. Yeah. Um, I think we, I think it, it won't make a difference. I don't think it will make a difference. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Good old Rusty. And still awake in the UK. Yeah, I just don't want to put people to sleep. 40 people watching. And let's see what else we got here. Now I've got 44. All right, good. All right, so since we're on the Pro 1000 topic, this is what you need. And preferably, you would need like a 100 milliliter syringe, so a big one. The reason being, and I'm not going to do the process in front of you because I'll dirty up my tip. So you need one of these tips, and you buy these from Precision Colors. You buy the large, um, or even they came up with a method for you to actually refill the cartridge directly from the bottle. Yes. So what they do uh, is have your bottle with the lure uh, tip on it. Basically, that means it's a screw type adapter, and they attach the so-called tip on there. And what you will do is simply this. You will squeeze because the 82 milliliters of ink will come in a much larger capacity bottle. That allows you to squeeze the bottle, insert the cartridge directly into the tip as far as it will go. Then you let go of the bottle, and that will then expand the bottle back out, will create an internal vacuum. You flip it upside, right side up, actually. This will be upside down, looking up. And you allow the ink to enter and fill that vacuum that you created. And then you squeeze again, and so far, so on, so on, until you fill the ink. Because you have to do that because there is no way for air to escape. So you have to create this vacuum uh, situation. 
Now you can pressurize your ink in as well. So that involves doing this. So say for instance, this is this is 80 ml of ink. Okay, of course it's only 40, but just you know, imagine you put that in there and you squeeze and you can't squeeze anymore. So then you bring back the nozzle, you bring back the plunger, I mean, and you create a vacuum. And that's it. That's as much vacuum as you can create. You have ink about this much now left. You fill it in. And you can't fill any more in. And you pull back and create a vacuum again. And slowly but surely, with this back and forth pulling in and out, creating a vacuum and allowing ink to take care of that void, you will eventually put your 80 milliliters of ink in there or 82. You can put 82. They give you 82. You really only need 80. Now, you must start always from an empty cartridge, okay? That means that you allow the chip to declare the situation empty and not print anymore. You stop at that point. Absolutely. You don't want to then draw air internally, which will then have to be vented by the internal compartment. Yeah, it'll work, but you don't really want to push your luck. Okay. So you allow the ink to empty itself. The chip says I'm empty. The cartridge is empty. You remove it. You weigh it. It weighs 32 grams. You're ready to perform that refill. It's actually quite simple. And once you get the knack of it, it's actually easy and, and mess free. And the only difficult sometimes process is to remove this cap. You really need about four hands to do it correctly. Uh, there are several tabs that need to be loosened. And then you remove this. You don't want to damage this because you don't want to lose this and have it come off prematurely from the cartridge while you are printing. Of course not. Now, somebody wanted to know, because I always talk about extracting inks from large capacity cartridges. And they have to be OEM. They have to be original ones because I want to use as much as possible OEM inks. Now, this one has ink in it. This is a 110 milliliter cartridge right there. And it is a Vivid Light Magenta. So I can use this on my 3880. I can use this on my R3000 and my 2880 and so on. So, again, you would have to have a special tip. Where did I put that? Now I cannot find it. It's getting darker and darker in here, and I lost track of it. But anyway, it's quite small. It is similar to this one. It's white, and it has a slot cut right here. And that needs to be there so that it doesn't just seal itself against that poppet valve that lives internally on the cartridge. And it's very simple. You can actually just use a plain tip syringe if you just want to remove a certain amount, maybe 20 milliliters of ink, and just insert the syringe tip in there and just pull back. And ink will come right out, fill your syringe. There's an internal ink bag inside here. So the ink is always kept internally away from air. And that's the key point. Somebody said, well, I can just dismantle this cartridge and cut the valve right off the bag and just pour it in a bottle. Yeah, but from now on, that ink is going to be exposed to air at all times. So what I do is I just draw as much ink as I need. Look at this one. This is a much larger cartridge. I believe 220 milliliters. And again, the same thing. Insert the syringe tip and draw the ink required volume out. That's all you have to do. It's really, really easy and simple way to do that. Now, somebody wanted to know about refilling Pro 2000. Well, I thought, you know what? Think about it. This will cost $225. This is 700 milliliters of ink. $225, that is including shipping anywhere in the USA from my provider that I have a link for in my description. If you don't read my descriptions, then you miss out on a lot of links that I have there. So have a look and you will see many things, including the store link for the pre-modified Pro 100 uh, sets of 
cartridges. You can just buy a full set ready to be refilled. Refill them with precision colors inks. You're ready to print instantly. Why bother with the flushing and the drying that takes sometimes a whole week to achieve the correct weight? I just use these. Now, this is a little bit more difficult to extract ink from, okay? You have a double port system here. See those two holes right here? And then you have one here. So they have different, different um, purposes. One is to allow air to come in as ink is being drawn out. So you have to put a needle. Let me... And you have to put a needle into one of those ports. And then the one on the, let me see. This one right here toward the center is the one where the ink comes out. This one right here closer to the side is the one that allows air to come in. There is a pipe inside here that allows air to come in and sort of bubble aerate the internal uh, amount of, this does not, have an ink bag, by the way. This is just a container full of ink. So as air goes in, it aerates the ink, it resuspends it, and then the central one allows the ink to come out. So what you do is you put a small stubby needle in here, about an inch long, and then you put your syringe with another longer needle in this one, and then you're able to tilt it very carefully. This is a real pain, and draw ink out. As you draw ink out, because you have a needle inserted in there, air can then enter. And you got to be careful because you might get some leaks of air. Now, what some people have done, because there's even ink here, or what they'll do is they will drill a hole somewhere, drill a little vent hole somewhere else, and literally pour that ink into a bottle. You need about a liter bottle to be able to put 750 milliliters of ink. But, hey, whatever works for you, this will allow you to fill your Pro 1000 cartridges probably at least eight times. And even if you're on the Pro 2000, you can use these big giant cartridges. And how often do you have to change them? I don't know, maybe once a year. So, you know, if you're producing prints for money, then it's, it's really worth it to... I can get this in there now. It's really worth it to go this route rather than just, you know, waste your time refilling these cartridges. They're a pain in the neck to refill. Although they, they can be they can be refilled, but they're a pain in the neck. Now, one thing that you could do literally is turn these into refillable cartridges, just like the ones that China sells, which I do not trust. Okay, that's it. I, I give up on this. Okay, I got it. I don't trust them. Uh, somebody had recently some problems with um, leakage, yeah. And so they drill a hole and they put a plug on it. That's it. And they, because these are not pressurized at all. So they put a, a side hole on the, um, maybe on the top of the handle and put a plug and they refill them that way with a little funnel. They, it's a rather large diameter hole and plug. And you just use a funnel and fill the cartridge with ink. And they do have single-use chips. I believe China is selling them. I don't know whether they're, you know, reliable or not, but they do have them. For two, 225 for a set, a one, I mean, for one cartridge. And again, that's every, every once in a while you'll have to do that. Okay, because that's a lot of ink. That's three quarters of a liter of ink. Um, tell you the truth, I have been printing on my P800 and my Pro 1000. I filled them once so far. How long have I had that Pro 1000? A couple of years at least. Yeah, so that tells you that really ink will last a pretty long time. Even on the Pro 1000, believe it or not. I think our, our waste ink volume was 170 something grams of ink. Really, that's not a huge amount when you think about how many prints I have actually created with that printer. All right, let's see what else we got here. Come on, folks. 
Ascoy. I'm going to go ahead and look at the Facebook group or YouTube, maybe YouTube. And by the way, we are almost at 4,000 Facebook group members, which I think is fantabulous. Let's go ahead and look at the YouTube. Whoop. Here we go. We'll make it full. Oh, no. We'll put myself in there. Why not? Like that. There you go. So let's see what we got here. Let me scroll over to the other monitor. And I got to look up real close. Why do you have so many printers, Jose? That I thought that was kind of funny. Um, if you don't know why I do then I don't think I can I can help you. Um, in case you didn't notice what this channel is about, yeah. That's why we have so many printers. Okay, let's see what else we got here. And this are these are some reactions to the the most recent video about you know the Pro 1000. And I, I love the way some people have reacted. Reality check. Most folks simply do not print enough. This is Dunny Monster. He used to come on this uh, live stream a while back. You can read that on your own. Uh, Pro 100 in the UK is about maybe 400 euros and, uh, or pounds. I don't know if, the, yeah, that's euros. I can, or pounds, I don't know. Anyway, um, so not exactly an impulse to buy with a new set. Oh, somebody, this guy had a, ah, I get it. He has a local with a Pro 100, I believe it was. Two sets of uh, cartridges for 80 Oh, no, that's $80 a set. Wow, that's a lot of money. You see what I mean? See how well we have it here in the U.S.? People in other parts of the world, world are, are just paying through the nose for just the pleasure of printing. That's great. That is crazy. Um, you, wanna, you guys want to hear something funny? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you guys because... I thought it was hilarious. I get I get some comments from one guy, and I haven't blocked them yet because I just get a kick out of them. He always comments the same thing about how, how awesome the videos are, how much you enjoyed it. And then he said, you should be getting a lot more views. I said, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Um, if you did um, videos on how to fix a toilet or how to do this, or how to, you'd probably get a lot more views. Well, you know what? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm supposed to change my channel to how to fix toilets, and I'll be guaranteed thousands of views. I'd rather not. I enjoy printing. I enjoy flying drones too much. I enjoy everything about photography, not about fixing toilets. I'll leave that to the plumbers who know how to fix toilets. And if they get thousands and thousands of views, that's fabulous. I'm ecstatic for them. Um, not this guy. I'm not going to be doing toilet videos. Okay. Yeah. Um, he actually felt bad, I think, for me because... For whatever the reason, he thinks I don't get enough views, that I should be getting more views by virtue of the content that we have. So I guess I appreciate that. Let me show you guys. Let me see. It is 629. Throw some questions at me, please, because at this point, we have no more subjects to discuss. I really, I think I beat the... Pro 1000 horse till it's dead. And hopefully that 
that will sink in and those of you who have it realize that yeah that you are paying for that amazing output you are paying for the fact that if you are using oem and you're not doing refilling like we do which that could possibly have a a, res a negative result on ink flow maybe it depends how well you do it if you're just using oem cartridges as most of us do when we first get that printer you can't complain about the output it is fabulous it is fantastic internal spectrophotometer to read printed internal calibration charts it makes to make sure that the printer is capable to output as best it can okay as intended by the those geniuses the engineers that created this this uh, amazing piece of tech and so do the other ones the the 2000 and up as well these are features never found on any other similar type printer family so it self maintains itself you just got to put up with that you just got to accept that so that every single time i print i know that my results are going to be fabulous i'm not going to be plagued by weird little lines like i did with the pro 100 the pro 100 did that to me ah i happen to have it right here those of you who are new this week haven't seen this yet so the other day i decided to do just a collage of uh, standard images and i started to get this and i thought oh my god what's going on so i stopped the print job ran a nozzle check and it told me that my i think it was my uh, black was not printing correctly okay it was actually lacking so i took care of that ran a nozzle check verified that problem because I, I immediately knew it was a black i mean i see no black here at all so i immediately knew that so i went ahead and did a nozzle check to verify it boom there it was and i thought oh okay hey even even happens to me right so then i went ahead and did a cleaning cycle another nozzle check perfect i topped off all the cartridges i set them i i um you know reset everything actually this was the pro 10 not the pro 100 pro 10 and so i then proceeded to print and this is the difference top is now correct the bottom one is lacking black and you can just see it looks it looks almost solarized like it's like i took the black out and for those of you who may not know black is only used to accent those deeper tones the the dark tones are composited from all of the other colors and black and grays especially the dark grays used to accent the darker tones without black you get nothing but gray looking weird solarized look to your prints so yeah it happens to the best of us and i don't want to say including me because i'm such a big shot no it happens to everybody in as well as me but the pro 1000 the pro 1000 will likely not ever have that problem you see the pro 10 also but even the pro 10 and the pro 100 um you neglect it you don't use it and that preemptive cleaning cycle that it performs before you print it may or may not be enough to clear a clog i don't know whether that was a clog or whether that was a problem with the cartridge and lack of ink flow i really don't know what the cause was so i decided to just you know refill them all up and um, everything is fine so far so the other day let me put this over here i decided to um do a little flying in my backyard now i got a i got i got a tree back there that's just blooming and it's going nuts with the flowers so i decided to do a video where somebody had asked me well what does the raw video look like and what does an edited or color graded video and the same thing with photographs raw files look kind of drab compared to your final edit so i decided to do that i took one of my drones up and i just basically went up 
and went down that's it like a minute each and then i proceeded to do a basic edit and i actually cropped the image so it wasn't 16 by 9 but more more of a um, widescreen cinematic view and all i did was i adjusted color a little bit and sharpened it a little bit and then uh, set my color balance a little bit more warmer because it was a very cloudy kind of cold day very bluish lighting out there so I'll go ahead and show you that, and then uh, we'll tackle any more questions that you may have. Um, got a couple more here. We're going to deal with those once we uh, do this. And I hope you enjoy it. It'll be silent at first because I did nothing with the music or anything like that. So we'll go ahead and play it. I'll talk during the silent part. So basically, it's a parent and Afi 4K, simple up and down, full and then raw and then edit it so raw from the uh sd card and there it is we're just taking off you can see how drab the uh, lighting is and there's my my tree right there and again like i said we just went up in the air hovered a little bit above the tree and i adjusted the camera angle a little bit again i wasn't trying to show off my flying skills at all it was just about the video and people saying well should i just leave the video alone and never never edit it should i just leave it pure and the reality is that no you should not you should do something to improve that look and now we just come back down in a little bit and i did not cut anything off i didn't crop it i didn't you know, trim the ends. It's from beginning to end. You'll see it land. And this spring, I'm going to remove all of that wood that you see back there getting in my way. It's all half dead anyway. So that'll be a good job for my son and I. And I got to get rid of all that metal that I have laying over there. Give it to the metal guy that comes every once in a while every once in a while all right so we land here now we're going to go ahead and do the same thing but this is edited with music and also the crop so as you can see the contrast is a little better colors a little bit more a little bit stronger the white point is closer to a white i use a scope that allows me to determine it's sort of like a, a histogram, but it's a sort of a, a three-dimensional type scope. And it allows you to see all of the areas. Basically, it sort of shows you the densities in charted. So in a, in a two-axis um, type graph. But basically, it includes the whole image. It's rather neat to see it in that way. It's not a huge improvement, but it's better. You don't want to go overboard with this. You just want to keep it subtle so that when people look at it, they think that's the way it came out of the camera. If you over manipulate it, just like with an image, if you over manipulate it, it'll be obvious that what you, you know, what you were doing. There you go. And that's what I do for fun. All right. So you can take photographs. Okay. See, right now, everybody's in lockdown. That's all I can do. Okay. I cannot do anything more than that. Um, this area right now is sort of blanketed with a no fly type thing. So I stay you know, secretly in my backyard and uh, no one knows what I'm doing. So that allows me to keep my drones exercised just like my printers. And so I will do that. Try to come up with um, things that I can do to also help answer questions from other watchers that have been watching my drone-related videos. 
And again, I try to keep it not just about flying, but about the link to photography that these pieces of uh, electronic uh, wonders uh, allow you to do. Imagine you can go 100 feet, tilt the camera in any angle you want, and shoot a shot that you can basically compose in your screen of your phone, and the camera will create a raw file of that, which you can then edit to your heart's content, like you would edit any image from any of your cameras. Again, that's that's the way I look at it. It's just another form of photography, although sure is fun and relaxing to fly. All right, let's see what else we got here. We're going to go ahead and activate this one right here. CT with three. I'm looking at buying a Pro 10. Can I refill the cartridges in that printer? Of course. Of course you can. The simplest ones ever. This is this is just God's gift to the refillers world. What I suggest, I don't know where you're located. Please tell me where you're located. If you're still here with us, tell me where you're located. Let me put you back up. If you are in the USA, what you do is you go to precisioncolors.com. Precision colors, one world, one world, one word.com. And buy the signature edition inks for this particular uh, printer model, Pro 10. When you buy the kit, you will get the resetter for these cartridges. Okay. You can run these until they are empty. Okay. You reset them. And you drip fill them. What you do is you get the kit that has the squeeze bottles. They will come with a syringe needle attached to the top. The ink will be inside the bottle. You just basically tip it and you will drip, drip, drip into that sponge. You see that sponge right there? There's a bag inside. That's just the exit cover, which is a spongy material. The ink will enter, literally, physically enter, fill the bag up. You keep this on a scale like that. Open up the lid, of course. Let's do that correctly. You turn it on. You place it on top like that. And you drip, drip, drip until you reach 32 to 33 grams of total weight. You give it a little squeeze on the side, you will see ink begin to flood the sponge. You let go, the ink will recede internally again. And where did I put my, my clip? Man, I, lose, I would lose my head if it wasn't attached. Here it is. And like so. So do not throw these clips away if you decide to get this printer. Simple. You're done. That's it. You pop it back into the printer, and you're good to go. You can do one cartridge at a time. It will simply take you about maybe a minute to do so. That's plenty of time. The printer will not be moving over to the parking area, so it'll wait for you for about five minutes. So make sure you do this quickly, okay? And using the squeezy bottle system, that precision color sells you will actually speed the process to, to no end. It's the, it's the quickest way to do this. Stephen Polboy is here from Toronto, Canada. Okay, you're in New York, so no problem. Hey. PrecisionColors.com. Just go there. And if you already have the printer, then so much the better. Uh, if you do not, then again, that'll be the perfect printer to get because you'll get outstanding results, outstanding results, and easy to refill. And it's not a crazy ink waster like the Pro 1000. It's not as demanding, let's just say. It'll still perform those cleaning cycles. Don't get me wrong. But when you start to refill, you really don't worry too much about that. Um, so yeah, it's just probably the simplest printer to refill. Um, I have plenty of videos on that. I have a whole playlist on the Pro 10, 
Um, everything you want to know is there. Okie doke. Let's go to the next one. Hello, Jose. I have not been able to find print longevity data on Wilhelm or Ardenberg using cone color precision colors. Actually, uh, not, not with the uh, signature edition inks. Um, we only did a few tests with the earlier inks. And of course, they did not come up to par as far as longevity compared to OEM. Of course, we knew that dye inks probably about it 10 times less longevity. Uh, nobody has that test data. In order for them to be able to do that, they would have to find someone who would be willing to do the print printing of the charts that they require for them. I could do that, but they haven't contacted me in Ardenburg at this point. They just have no funding to be able to continue doing these types of tests. They rely on user um, funding. Thank you. It's getting late in the UK. You guys need to go to bed, my friends. All righty. Well, I hope that, you know, we were informative tonight. I hope you enjoyed this evening's um, live stream. Um, again, I'm looking forward to having Q Image Ultimate's author and creator, as well as the Q Image One for Mac creator. And the reason we want to have them here is because we want to talk about, especially on the Macintosh side, side the Apple side, uh, some folks are having problems just, you know, out of the, out of out of the blue with color casts that they feel they're not introducing in their images, especially when they're doing a black and white. You should get a nice neutral result. Nothing is ever going to be dead on neutral, measured by an instrument. Don't get me wrong; you will always have a slight tonality, probably undetectable unless you have two images side by side, two prints side by side you may not see the difference i happen that happens to me all the time i have 13 printers i can print 13 monochromes and they will all have a slight tonal uh change it will not be absolute neutral okay you're probably asking too much of your printers okay all right they are not perfect they do not produce perfection close enough is what you get and as long as that close enough is indeed close enough, then it's good enough. Who is calling me? I think it's for my wife. All right. So, yeah, just remember that. Don't expect miracles. Um, you're limited by your monitor calibration. You're limited by the gamut of your printer able to produce you saw what i was able to produce with the pro 100 earlier that's using even third-party inks you could not tell the difference between the printed with third-party inks and the one printed with oem inks okay if i leave them out in the sun for the next year or so you will see the difference between the two even the oem one will fade okay but the one with a third-party source ink will fade a lot quicker. Uh, at this point, I have upstairs, right up the stairs back there, at the top of the stairs on the wall facing east. That's east, this is west. I have one standard image printed with OEM, one standard image printed with Precision Color Signature Edition on Pro Luster paper, the worst paper for a, a fade test, believe me. And it's been up there, it will be a year in August in mid-August. I just looked at it today. I look at it every time I come downstairs and I'm still having problems detecting any changes. So not bad. Now that's untreated. That's without any kind of protection that is bare exposure to the elements and the light, okay? So you want to preempt any kind of a possible fading that you're, you know darn well you're gonna get with third-party inks and you should consider framing under glass. Do like Rusty does. He only produces 
prints that are going to go on the walls. And so those are going to be framed. They're going to be under glass. That by itself will triple, quadruple your lifespans of your prints. Okay. Spray them. Okay. Especially if they are printed on a non resin coated paper. That alone will increase longevity to begin with. But give them a spray front and back. You want to seal the back so that ozone cannot enter and sneak in through the rear fibers of that paper base and then permeate through the underneath um, layers of each one of those layers on that emulsion and attack your inks. Dye inks will fade very quickly that way. And you also want to seal the top. The reason that ozone is able to attack those print so easily is because we're using a microporous coating on papers now. And that allows ink to immediately kind of dry up. So when it comes out of your printer, it's almost ready to touch. Some papers, not so much. Some papers, yes. But resin coated papers, definitely. They come out to the point where, yeah, they're ready to be touched. And that's because of that microporous surface or coating. That allows ozone to just come in readily and just you know, oxidize those inks to the point where they start to fade, depending on your ozone layer. No, depending on your ozone um, amount in your atmosphere, levels, yeah, that's it. It will fade quickly. In a couple of months, it'll show signs of fading or not. Here in my house, they say not. Okay, I have no signs of fading yet. So it depends. If you have... Somebody had some prints hanging in a repair shop where they do a lot of arc welding. Well, guess what? UV is ridiculous from an arc welder. Those prints didn't last but two weeks. Simple as that. Your environment is everything, and also the way you pre-treat those prints after you let them dry fully. You can seal them with a good spray, Moab Desert Varnish, Hanner Meal Protectant Spray, and there are many others. You can find them on my Amazon affiliate page, by the way. Okay. If you haven't seen that, there's a link right on my main channel page and also on every video description. Please read the descriptions. Okay. That's where you will find links to a lot of things that you will need. If you want to refill your cartridges on your Pro 1000 and you live in the USA, 225 for 750 ml and if that's too expensive for you sometimes you find them for less on ebay they may be a little bit expired but their inks are still good don't worry about that so again read the descriptions i try to put something in there informative for you guys to see all right Looking to the chat about QImage, got my questions already. Okay, so that's going to happen. He's got to let me know because he wants to coordinate it with uh, Andrew. And I did notice Andrew has an Australian accent. So he may be in Australia for all you know. So there's going to be a time frame difference, obviously. Now, if he lives in the USA, I really don't know. I don't get personal. I really uh, don't know why we haven't been able to coordinate it yet. Now, Mike is down in uh, the Tampa region of Florida, so down there, southwestern Florida. So that's not a problem at all. And I said to him, um, I need to address some Apple Macintosh, Mac driver problems uh, when it concerns QImage. And then we also want to discuss all of the features that QImage uses and some of the things that it uses to save you from making mistakes while you print, while you're printing using ICC profiles, pretty much automatic. It's the only one that I actually trust, okay? Not too many things I trust. I'm a hands-on check by myself, make sure that I have manually set some settings up. I don't want to be told, oh, we've already automatically taken care of that for you. No, I'm not that type of guy. So. At least QImage has proven to me that, yeah, when they say it is set correctly, it is set correctly. Because I go back and double check anyway. I don't take even its word for it. All 
All right. Steve King. Jose, sorry if I haven't answered this. I had to tune out for a while. Can I change the defaults of my Pro 1000 driver? No, you cannot. Cannot. I wish I, I wish I could. I would have done it already. The defaults are there. That is it. It is kind of uh, how they say etched in stone. Yeah, it's part of the uh, firmware. For example, I like to set paper print quality. And, oh, this is different. I thought you were talking about like maintenance cycles. Do you prefer settings? Well, I don't know whether you can change settings. I don't know what, you know, I don't do anything in my driver at all. There's nothing I adjust. What I have in my monitor is what my printer spits out. There's nothing. I, I set it for, I use Windows, so I set my defaults to high quality. And most of the time I'm using ProLuster. So I don't know whether you mean, and color management, I just control that myself. You know, so. Um, I, I think you mean like save a preset. Um, I know you could do that on Epson, but I don't know about the uh, Canon printers. Again, I, I I I use Q Image to print everything, so there it saves everything for me. Okay, and Q Image will even allow you to save a job, so that remember I got thirteen printers. So let's just say I print a job of fifteen prints, fifteen different images on a certain paper with this profile this layout and it comes out perfect i love it and then seven months later the mother-in-law wants a set of prints just like the ones i made for the other mother-in-law of the bride i saved that as a job i named it i i dated it so i know i can go back through my hundreds of different jobs locate that one open it It'll say, do you want to open it as a job? Duh. Click job. It will then, as long as all my drives that I have connected to my computer are still connected, it'll just link up all of those images that I had. Boom. Done. Print. Done. It'll use the same printer regardless of whether I have one or 13 connected to my computer. It'll pick that very same printer. The layout will be the same. The settings will be the same. The driver settings will be the same. The profile that I use will be the same because it remembers that. Now, that, that is assuming that you don't change anything in your computer. In other words, your images are still living in the same folders. Even if they're scattered through different drives, it will find them instantly. And you still have those ICC profiles that you use, that one profile that you use. Okay, and you didn't decide to print it on a different kind of paper, you see. So it's wonderful. So many things. That's just one of the. That's one thing that would ask actually get me to buy that program. Okay, another amazing feature, and I mean just mind-boggling. Two things actually. I have hundreds and hundreds of profiles in my computer, as you can imagine, custom-made ones and the ones that come with each of the drivers. Say I want to print on my Pro 1000 or my P800. It doesn't really matter. My 3880. And I got a box of Epson paper. And I load that Epson paper in my printer. And in the driver, inside QImage, I say I want to print on presentation mat. Okay? When I go to look for my profile among those hundreds and hundreds of profiles, I click on a little... Magnifying glass. It's just a little loop like the detectives use. I click on that. Guess what profile is now located on the top? It wasn't before. It was buried somewhere. Guess what profile is located on the top? The one that I need. Click. Load that profile. It was there, but it was mixed among, you know, maybe 600 profiles. So there you go. 
not only will I assign, uh, at least suggest to you, hey, we think this is the profile that you're looking for. And you go, damn, I, it is. Click, that's it. You're done. Now, now that I'm using your profile, uh, you have to tell the driver to not interfere with the instructions from that profile. You see what I'm saying? That's called double profiling. Now, normally, you have to manually go into the driver and choose no color management so that then QImage can manage the color through that profile. But what if I forgot to do that in my driver? What if that driver is set to ICM, color matching? Basically, it's going to use that same profile, double. You're going to get your, your color is going to be off, OK? Q image will halt that process, that mistake from taking place. If I forgot to set it to no color management, it's going to say, you're going to get a little warning. It's going to say, your settings have been changed in your driver. And you go to your driver and look, and sure enough, it is now set to no color management because I'm letting Q image manage color. What if I tell Q image, oh, just let the driver control color? Okay. And I choose that paper presentation mat. Well, what if the driver, I forgot to set it to driver matching or ICM so that it uses that profile? It's going to show me, oh, you had a set of no color management. We have switched it for you to ICM. Boom. And I have tried to fool it. I have tried on purpose to double profile. Okay. And it, it can't happen. He just won't let me do it. It's always correcting me. And I go, damn, I try to fool it, but it won't let me. Another thing is that if you print, let me show you what I'm talking about. If you want a custom profile made for you, this one's on canvas. You have to print one of these charts. And it has to be printed a certain mode, a certain color managed mode, which many applications will not allow you to do that. QImage has a specific custom built mode for printing color charts. So when you go to order a profile from me and you download the charts that I provide you, the images, you have to open them in a application that will allow you to print them with zero, and I mean, Zero color management, not from the application or the printer. And Q image will do that for you automatically. I also give you a free utility to print those if you don't have Q image. But nevertheless, if you do own Q image, then you don't have to worry about it. If you have a, a, a set of charts that you need to have printed, and then you send those to a profile, a profiler like me, and I need to make sure that you printed those correctly so that I can then create a correct profile for you. You see, if you did not print those correctly, then my profile that I create for you is not going to be correct. And I will not do it. I will not know that until you get back to me and say, hey, my prints are not coming out neutral. Well, that's not my fault, you see. So anyway, QImage is wonderful for that. So that's another advantage of QImage. And we're going to be covering, I hope we cover quite a bit of stuff. And um, I don't know whether I will have them on for the whole three hours or just maybe an hour section, but I will try to you know, work as much as we can with whatever questions you guys come up with. Okay. I think we got a few more here. Moving to Linux for sole drawback is printing Q, Q image solution coming. I have no idea. I have no idea. I think not. I think they only work with Windows and Mac. Cal Johnson. There's a question on Facebook. If a whole nozzle will ever clear, you mean an, a channel or a, or a single nozzle, will ever clear for R3000? I have the same issue. So I ask this too, what should we do? So please, you know, tell me a bit more. Um, 
Is it just a single nozzle? Or do you refer to, some people make the mistake to say nozzle, meaning the channel. Um, and what color? What color is it? I really haven't looked at Facebook all day today, so I haven't I haven't got a clue what this one's question was about. So I'll let you clear that up in the next few minutes. We've gone over the three hour already, so go ahead and Cal, let me know what you mean by that, and then later on I'll I'll go ahead and uh, scour through uh, Facebook and see. Are you sure it's not? Is it a black? Okay, it could be. It could be related to the uh, switch nozzle check. Yeah, nozzle check channel is black, but which which one? What color? Light magenta on thirty eight eighty and others, and theirs on the R three thousand. Okay. So, and there's an R3000 like case. So it doesn't seem to be related then. Um, all I can tell you is to check your ink line. Okay. It could be that you just have air in there. Usually a channel just doesn't go blank. Two things can, can be the cause. Either there's no ink in the line, there's no ink in the damper anymore. Or that channel's electronically failed. Okay. That's very unlikely. Epson printheads are super tough. Um, so check the ink lines. That's all I can tell you. And then uh, if that is the case, and if you're refilling by any chance, then you're going to have to check your, your cartridge to make sure that the... Let me see if I have a... a yeah, here we go. R3000 cartridge, refillable. Make sure that the priming chamber... Let me find that. I don't know if you can see that little circular right there by my finger. Make sure that that area there has ink, okay? That's the priming chamber. It has to be not full of ink, but it has to have maybe half full of ink. And that allows its siphoning to take place so that the port actually receives ink, not just air. And it could be that if you if you open up your lid, and you take a look at your, at your actual uh, ink lines and locate that one to see if there's actual ink in it. If there is ink in it, all the way to the printhead assembly, then I, I really don't know what could be the cause. I'm sure that you have run, you know, cleaning cycles already. So, all right. Well, thank you guys so much for hanging with me yet again. Yet again, this is getting to be a lot of fun. I think we're at somewhere around the 65th or 6th, maybe even higher, live stream. So, when, when, once we hit 100, we'll have a big celebration. All righty. Okay, so if, there is, if that is it for now, I'll give you guys one more second here. If not, then I will go ahead and terminate this. All I got to do now is go over here and hit the end broadcast button. Does it for you automatically. Not a problem. Oh, here we go. Et, I almost, I almost left you guys, and I have one more question. Um, Ct with three suggestion for which fine art to start with. What are you talking about? Paper or printer? That's a hard question. Always, always a hard question because it's it's up to you. It's not up to me. You know. Paper. Okay, so what printer are you using, CT? You probably told me before, but, you know. And what is it that you're trying to achieve? I mean, what look are you looking for? Do you want a fine art paper with a shine? You want a fine art paper with a smooth matte surface? Pro 10. Okay. You want a fine art paper with a nice rough texture? I mean, what is it that you want? There are so many different kinds. What is that? A B. What is that B for? I'm new to this. Yeah, that's fine. So we were all new to this too. Not a problem. 
That's what I'm here for. Keep in mind that the Pro 10, okay, uh, when it comes to printing on matte papers, they have an idiosyncrasy. Let me look, let me locate my cartridge. So there are two. Okay, so I think he means A3 plus. So that's 13 by 19 here in the US. So that still doesn't answer like what style of paper you're looking for or what type of um, fine art prints you want to create. Um, to me, a fine art print just screams a nice texture and either a very, very soft gloss or a matte and no resin coated you're talking about like 100 percent fiber based papers whether they are cotton rag or or whatever so the easiest way is to experiment if you already have the pro 10 find a paper manufacturer hanemule ilford moab red river um ink press uh, innova any of those and also on ebay and look for sample paper packs because they will provide you with especially if they have like a fine art paper pack you're going to pay a lot less and get a sampling of all other papers and then you can play around with your pro 10 uh, printing on these papers using different images. So some images will suit certain types of paper better than some other images will. So I always use the example of, um, you know, a nice portrait of a baby laying on a pillow sleeping. Very pastel, nice pinks, light blues. You would not print that on a metallic paper. It looks awful. Whereas a shot of a, a show car, that engine picture that I showed earlier, yeah, that would look fantastic on a metallic paper, but not a picture of a baby sleeping on a nice silk pillow, okay? So a landscape, if it's a landscape containing, containing a lot of greens and browns and rich oranges and that type of colors, toward that realm, the warm side of the spectrum, then you want a paper with a warm paper base and a nice rough texture. Landscape, okay. So that's what I'm talking about. So you would not want a glossy, cold, you know, surface paper. That would be suitable for a, for maybe a seascape in the winter time. Okay. A storm brewing in the horizon. That would be good for a nice cold, very neutral white base paper. Landscapes always, always do better with a nice, um, relatively medium to rough texture paper. Again, the best way to find out again is don't waste time buying boxes of paper. Just get a sample a sample pack. Uh, again, there are many paper manufacturers. Just look on eBay, eBay and um, see what you can find. I don't know where you're located, but again, whatever is easiest for you to acquire. All righty. All right, thank you guys so much again, man. We'll see you next week. I'll be having some videos come up. I got a couple more subjects that I need to address before the week is over. We're starting a new week tomorrow. I hope everybody's doing well with the lockdown. Oh, you're here in New York. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, heck, go on my uh, Amazon affiliate page. I have lots of paper sample packs there. Just order them there. You'll be helping the channel indirectly. You will not spend a penny more uh it'll be the same as you would if you had you know gone to your own amazon.com use the link on my description let me see if i can uh, show you guys where that's at yeah actually just just go on my description i have my amazon link in there all right thank you so much again guys we'll see you next week stay safe everybody bye bye